you made it to the Go Commando Show with Fred Galvin. On our new mission, we contend with the naked truths of health, leadership, and overcoming adversity. Now, it's time to Go Commando! Hello, Commandos. We've got a great show for you tonight, and a gentleman that I've known now for nine years is uh, with me tonight is Rob Trevino. And uh, it's not like Lee Trevino, it's T-R-I-V-I-N-O. This gentleman served in the Army for just over 20 years. His career is absolutely remarkable. He served in the most elite unit we have in the United States military. Uh, Began by enlisting immediately after he graduated high school, which was a year after I did. Uh, So our careers have some similarities other than he was in the Army and I was in the Marines. And uh, just like I had started and deployed, we both deployed to Desert Storm. He with the 18th Airborne Corps and myself with uh, the Marines Regimental Landing Team 5. But he uh, went on to serve in the Rangers. And then he also, following the Rangers, where he distinguished himself as the Ranger of the Year for the entire regiment, he went on and served in America's premier uh, special missions unit. And uh, we won't get into all the specifics of uh, what that unit is and what it's all about. We are going to talk about some of those missions and the leadership. So those of you commandos who have uh, undergone some trials, possible persecution at your workplace, and you want to know about how someone has effectively met those challenges and gone, you know, in around over through them and always persevered. And it wasn't always easy. He's going to talk about some of those physical and mental challenges that he's faced, how he overcame them. And, and I'm going to draw a lot out because he is a very humble man, but he's somebody that has incredible, incredible accomplishments. He's served in combat, both in Iraq and Afghanistan and other locations in the most high intensity aspects of those from the very beginning is one of the first, you know, army special operations forces personnel that deployed into Afghanistan in 2001. And he was also on the first wave in, uh, not just in desert storm and, and, and in Afghanistan, but also into the invasion in Iraq. Uh, but he's an incredible career. And he's one of the few men that I know that's but was able to maintain that while having a family, which is very difficult in the special operations community where you're constantly deploying. And even when you're home, the work schedule is very demanding and it's very high risk and it requires a lot of your concentration and your time. So without further ado, I want to bring you Rob Trevino. He is also, we're going to talk a lot about his his book and you can get this. I'm going to provide a link to this on the web and as well as a link to his website so you can order this book, which is his book, and he wrote it himself, no co-author, uh, and it is A war- a Warrior's Path, not The Warrior's Path, but A Warrior's Path. He wrote it's about his lessons in leadership, and that's what it is, A Warrior's Path, Lessons in Leadership, and you can uh, you can get it through his website, you can get it through Amazon, and I'm going to have the links to those uh, so I will say this, and I don't, uh, I know a lot of people, you, you can tell I learned a lot from him and from his books, uh, highlighted and tabbed throughout this entire book, hands down. Uh, I was amazed at so many leadership books, which I have an entire library of, and I, he's not paying me to say this, there's no paid advertising. This is the best book on not just tactical frontline fighting, but practical Stuff that makes sense. This is not one of these books on 12 to 8 steps that you can't even remember. This is his life experience, what he used, and how successful it was. Uh, and again, he's a, <clears throat> he's a gentleman that I had uh, come out and train our special operations instructors when I uh, served in the Marine Corps and in the special operations community. Um, he went on to establish a relationship with myself and the unit that I uh, served in, uh, stayed in my house uh, with his other partner, 
uh, we got to know each other very well over many dinners after work, and uh, and to this day, you know, over nine years later, we uh, still maintain that. I'm very proud to call him a friend and to see how accomplished he is. His company, which you can go to uh, Evergreen Mountain LLC, and I'll have and that'll be in the banner here. So those of you listening on the podcast, please. Uh, go to the YouTube or go to the Go Commando Show website and uh, where it's all listed uh, so you can reference his website. He does provide training to individuals as well as groups uh, that want to either meet him at his location or he uh, often travels to their location and provides not only leadership training but special skills uh, from you know rifle, pistol, and shotgun to other uh, more advanced training and skills that law enforcement community or different high net worth individuals uh, like to protect their families. So uh, he is a very valuable resource. And I don't say that from being inexperienced. Like I mentioned, uh, over nine years ago, I brought him out to train our special operations instructors in the Marine Corps. And he uh, did that very effectively, repetitively, and maintains those relationships, and uh, so it's, it's something I have a very personal knowledge with. So, welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Fred. Appreciate it. Yes, and so many of the commanders that are out there listening, uh, not just from you know the United States, but a lot of the listeners are from India, um, and you actually have uh, you're Indian by blood, but Native American, different Indian blood, and. Uh, you did not start your life and you weren't raised in a high net worth lifestyle. You didn't live on the country club, but you faced those struggles growing up, uh, struggles to, you know, keep, you know, a lot of food on the table. Uh, and it was never sufficient. And I, similar to growing up with six kids in our family, I mean, we learn not to waste anything and to be very, uh, cognizant of, you know, whatever we had because it, there was not a, a lot of it. But you are raised by your father who also served in the military, and he was someone who taught you how to hunt at an early age. And would you talk to the listeners about your lifestyle growing up and specifically regarding um, not having a lot and what hunting meant to you to provide for your family? Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, we didn't have a whole lot growing up as a as a kid. Uh, my family, I grew up with um, two brothers and a sister, and my mom and my father. And we uh, we lived off my father's pension. He was medically retired from from the army, and uh, many times that money didn't go very far. So we had to work, and that's one of the one of the few things that my father taught us early on was: if you want anything in this life, you've got to work for it. Yes. And um, so that, and on top of um, uh, my mother's input and in raising us as kids, we again we didn't have a whole lot. And to specifically answer your question with regards to hunting, it it was more than a sport to us. I mean, right. we we relied on that meat to feed the entire family. But I also grew to love the aspect of the hunt. I think um, there's all different types of people in the world. I'm one of these individuals that that grew to enjoy, um, and now do it a, a, as a man now. Where before, when I was um, as a kid, it was part of being. It was a necessity at the time, and now it's not so much, but it's still a necessity. In that, I learned so much doing that as a kid, um, and now I'm teaching that to my children too. So, yes, and. Like your father taught you the importance of not just work, but hard work and, you know, following through some of those life lessons that he was training you in hunting and the disadvantage that uh, some people, they want everything quick these days. But in your book, you mentioned in the, the beginning of it about hunting that you made a lot of those mistakes and you know what your father was trying to teach you, you kind of thought oftentimes, I know better, I can... I can do this my own way. And there's a little rebellious, but uh, you eventually learn that, you know, hunting is not just a skill that requires precision with a weapon and you like the bow, but it required patience and a lot of 
trial and error. And trial and error isn't anything bad uh, when it's when you're hunting out there and you, unless you're hunting a bear, uh, <laughs> you can make those mistakes, you know, and learn from them in an environment that's that's safe like that. But uh, can you talk about how some of when you were young with your father and you were learning those lessons through trial and error? and how that helped you later on in life in your profession. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, if, if you're a parent, and obviously you're a child and you had parents, there's a, there's, there's a unique relationship when you're the learner and the teacher is your father or your mother. Because it's very hard to learn from someone who... I, I, I have a, a, a saying that... that Nothing that I I coined myself, but it's it's very accurate. Is you can't be a prophet in your own village, yes. And that so that's very difficult for someone to teach in an area where you're already the leader, yes. And um, so for at that point in time in my life, I was the learner, and I thought I knew what I was doing, and I quickly realized that the one I didn't have the patience. And yes. like most teenagers at the time, I didn't have the patience. I wanted to see my efforts rewarded immediately, and, yes. and I essentially failed. And, and you, you got to learn from that. Yes. Everything in my life, I did not wake up and say, this is the right way to do it. I learned because I made a mistake. Right. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, they make those mistakes. Um, and when you look at several different units, when you look at... Uh, a unit that went out in Desert One, uh, they learned from those. It wasn't runaway success for the first of each. You, know, you look at whether it's the Army's first unit that did a, you know, precision long range mission like that, or SEAL Team Six in the Caribbean. I mean, their their first combat operations resulted in two separate events for casualties. The first Marine unit that deployed as a special operations in the 21st century, our unit. You know, we ran across a lot of obstacles, and in each of those occasions, you look at the leaders and what they did, and, you know, it wasn't, you know, saying, hey, this is too much. Uh, let's just go back to doing it the old way. You know, you, you have to look at that and continue to advance, and that's what a leader does is he looks with deep vision and uh, where you are and where you need to be and how you get there. So, uh but one of the key points you talk about, Rob, is you know patience, trial and error. Um, and when you're in youth, a lot of people are listening to this, and they're getting impatient with me because they want to hear about all the high speed stuff you did in your career in special operations. That's what they're chomping at the bit to get to. But they didn't learn those lessons like you and I when we were young. We wanted to do the high speed and sexy stuff, and but it took us a long time. The patience because uh, you know, like right now. And, you know, 2018, somebody can walk in a recruiter's office and sign up literally in the recruiter's office for a contract. It doesn't mean they will become one, but they'll contract them to be an Army Green Beret or a Navy SEAL. We don't allow them to do that in the Marine Raiders. <laughs> and uh, in your unit, too, you couldn't go from, you know, the street back on the block to the unit that you'd served in. It takes time and patience. And that's what one of the things that we talk about here, but... Tell us when you started and, you know, you joined the Army right after high school. Uh, your father had served in the Army. But what set that spark into you where you felt that the duty to answer your country's call? And what was it that, you know, while you're in the recruiter's office, what was it that you wanted to do? That's a, that's a great question. I think um, one thing that I got to make clear to all the listeners out there is that when I joined the Army— there was no war. If you, if you remember back then, Fred, there was nothing going on. Yes. There was no conflicts, nothing. No. So uh, it, I didn't have to make the decisions that the, that the individuals joining the military today have to make. It, it, it's a very difficult decision for, for everybody. For me at the time, I knew I wanted to be a soldier. I wasn't sure exactly what kind of soldier I wanted to be, um, but... That was just one of my goals. My second goal was to get some money for college. And at the time, the Army had the, uh, the Army College Fund, 
And just by enlisting for three years, they offered me $40,000, which was something that my parents could not afford uh, for me to, to go to college. So those were the primary reasons. Uh, little did I know that I would enjoy the Army as much as I did. And, and later in my, uh, after serving a couple of years, I realized this is what I want to do. And I, that was when I realized that was my the true answer to the calling of, of being in the service. So, so you, you wanted to be a soldier and you immediately went to, you know, your boot camp and at basic, you know, you graduated, no problems. You went to your first unit and how you described in, you, you know, your book, A Warrior's Path is you went to your first unit and it, now there were some leaders that you looked up to, mentors who inspired you, but then you also saw that, uh, People weren't doing everything, you know, to, you know, as, as intensely and with, with all the passion and enthusiasm. So, but you did see some people that were really inspiring, you know, one of your, uh, your company commanders who challenged you, uh, kind of set a spark that, you know, there's other things to do. But then on your own, there was an idea in, it, you had described in your book that you wanted to become something else. You want to serve in a unit like the U.S. Army Rangers. Uh, what was it, you know, was it seeing the Rangers or hearing them or reading about it? What set that spark and how did that develop in you? Because you couldn't, uh, again, through trial and error, you can't just want to become a Ranger. You have to prepare for that in order to succeed. And how was that part of your life and career in the Army? My first unit was was difficult, to, just being brutally honest. Um, I had some great leaders and again being brutally honest i have some absolutely horrible leaders and um if it wasn't for uh at the time captain arthur a sobers he was our section uh, one of the officers in our section and um he took a notice on how passionate i was to be the best soldier at the time that i could be whether i was um uh, raking the gravel outside or painting rocks or yes. doing the task that he asked me to do. I wanted it to do it the best that I could. And I had a problem with the individuals around me who did not share that passion with me. Yes. And I'd, there was a point in my car- young career as I, I was a specialist um, in the army, I realized I need to change where I am at. I want to be around people who do the right thing because they want to do it, not because they're being made to do it. So it's a choice that we all make. Self-initiative. Absolutely right. So that's, that was the spark initially yes. in me. And at the time when I joined, I joined the Army, I was an air defense operations and intelligence assistant. I hated it. <laughs> oh, I hated it. I was pushing paper and typing. They sent me to... Uh, to learn Lotus and, and database. And I was yes. on the computer and I, I it, it, yes. it was not my passion. And, um, so eventually the, the army phased that job out of its system and I was free to do what I wanted to do. And to that point in my short career, I realized the best unit in the army was the 75th Ranger Regiment. And I said, I'm I'm going to be an infantryman in the 75th Ranger Regiment. And I, that was my goal. Yes. So. You, you also mentioned that, and you stated in your book as well, very clearly, not just early on in your career, but you've seen it, you saw it repetitively through your career, that you know you started out in the 18th Airborne Corps, a job that people didn't give it their you know, what we call wholehearted approach. Everything wasn't in it, 100%. Uh, But then those were a lot of your peers and people that you worked with. But then you also stated in there and in several other parts in the book how you saw a lot of superiors, you know, utilize, you know, you said they were yellers and screamers and, you know, people that would, you know, basically use their rank to lord over. And you saw that there was a difference because you saw other leaders who were, effective because they would treat you like a human being and provide an explanation when time allowed. And they would do it with more of a, you know, thought and being mindful, you know, of, you know, the humanitarian aspect of, you know, you're a fellow soldier 
uh, you know, Kindred, we're all in this together as a team. Uh, can you describe a little bit about uh, the difference in that uh, leadership? Was, I'm assuming from the book, most of it, uh, the few occasions I recall were, you know, some officers kind of abusing that authority. Yeah, not necessarily an abuse of authority, just a, probably a misuse. And and um, at the time, when you're a young individual looking up, trying to find that leader that you that you want to emulate, um, and you see your leaders who can't control their emotions, who allow their emotions to take over and, and affect their decision making, that's not the leader I want to emulate. That's not the leader I want to be. So early on, and I didn't realize this, that, that I'd be writing a book when I was a private specialist in the Army, You're right. but I cataloged that in the back of my head. I said, this is not the type of leader I want to be. And um, so I would put those leaders on the bookshelf on this side, and then I would take the other leaders who had control of their emotions, who came forward to me and would treat me like a human being, even when I was wrong. Or even when I needed a correction, they didn't come and verbally assault me unless I truly needed it or the situation warranted it. But that wasn't their default. Whenever they had the time or the opportunity, they would move to me and treat me like a human being. And that was the leader that I wanted to emulate. Yes. And now that uh, first transition, you said you, you had that spark in your heart to serve as an Army Ranger. And then you went... I, I'm going to ask you two things if this question is from reading the book. And it's, again, you know, Rob Trevino served over 20 years and retired as a sergeant major. That's the senior enlisted rank in the United States Army. And he was with the best unit, literally, it's not my opinion, but the most elite unit, not just in the Army, but the entire United States military. But he gives some very raw examples in this book, a you know, a, a warrior's path, but it wasn't all easy. So in ranger school, you described, you, you met some challenges. And one of those was just sleep deprivation, a lack of sleep and, and how that uh, impacts your, not just your cognitive skills, but, you know, your ability to make decisions and act out. I mean, you, you had mentioned that, uh, you know, it took over control of other faculties and not just your mind, but you, you fell on your face a few oh, times. Yeah. And you had described some of those, challenges early on. And so a lot of people, they, they say they want to do this and they get in and they get discouraged because it's hard, but ranger school is really hard. And what was your experience at ranger school? Yeah. The, the, the two major components in, in ranger school that most people have difficulty with is one is a lack of sleep and two is the lack of food. And, um, and you've been there, you've been there, Fred, I'm sure is that uh, we've all been tired and hungry and exhausted and that's what the uh, ranger school is. And I can remember on several occasions, and, and then specifically in my book, I talk about that time where I face-planted um, dead asleep onto the ground. Uh, and then another occasion where I was, uh, I was made to be a junior leader as part of a rifle squad in ranger school, and I was a navigator. And um, the navigator can make or break your mission, because if you get the entire element lost— all the leaders in that in that uh, platoon fail. Yes. So that's a key skill, and and I maybe it goes back to my hunting skills, or I, I've I'm always sure. had a uh, a very good way to, or I've been always been well at finding my way around in the woods. Yes. And um, so when you show that you have that skill, specifically in ranger school, and you're a leader, and you know if you get your platoon lost you fail, you want the best navigator. And they leading, relied on you. And they relied on me quite a bit. Yes. So I was back-to-back -back navigators. For, it was probably my fourth mission. And uh, and they said, okay, Trevino, you're going to be the navigator again. I was like, God, doggone, man. I just want to, can I just walk on this one? <laughs> and uh, well, I eventually had to go in and listen to the patrol brief, get the initial yes. information dump. And I fell asleep right in front of one of the ranger instructors. Because of some of the, those responsibilities, you know, in ranger school, there are certain billet assignments that don't have that task where there is some recovery. Right. And when somebody is continuing 
you know, hitting the override button with one particular, and it's an important skill as a leader, you know, to, you know, it's in the military, good troop leadership skills is, you know, not just know your men and employ them within their capabilities, but to also, you know, be observant and decisive that, you know, you see somebody's, they're starting to show the signs of, you know, fatigue and then beyond fatigue, exhaustion, uh, you, you've got to make sure that that's sustainable. And you experienced that firsthand where you're pretty much in the spirit world. and Absolutely. <laughs> you couldn't even think, and then your body just gives out on you. It just shut down on me right in front of, right in front of the instructor, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it's embarrassing. And that's happened, I know, several days, you know, operating, you know, and myself previously, you know, you work two or three days straight without any sleep at all. And you start to make bad decisions and not everybody, you know, goes to that point where they're up for, you know, 72 continuous hours due to high intensity stress. But it could be, you know, that you're up, you know, or working 12 or 14 hours every day, you know, with little sleep because you're going home and it adds up that that cumulative effect. You start making bad decisions. And, And Rob and I are both here to talk to you about, you know, that. Your mind and your body need rest. You really do need to recuperate. But you had that not just initiative, but you follow through determination that no matter, you know, the stresses of ranger school, you know, there's environmental stressors there. You know, you're in the mountains, it's humid, and, you know, you're you're cold, you're starving, but you persevered. Um, Then you check into your first ranger unit and... It's sort of like when you joined the army, you had some perceptions of what the Rangers would be like, and then you check into the unit. Now you're you'd already served your first tour in the army, and you're checking in as a, a specialist, and you're actually, you know, authorized to wear you know uh, corporal chevrons to, to be a non commissioned officer. So you had seniority when you checked in, but the leaders. Your, your peers that you went there to check in. And the, the book describes it very well. And we don't have time to discuss it all, but I want Rob to hit on the highlights. And please, his book talks about the specifics. If you've ever had a job where you're supposed to be excited about this new opportunity and the, the very first day you get in there, you know, the, the people that are supposed to be showing you the ropes or doing a turnover to welcome you aboard or literally, uh, being condescending, closing doors. Rob, you faced that firsthand. And can you tell us a little bit about um, when you first checked into, you were out there in Washington State, 2nd Ranger Battalion, Alpha Company, uh, and you were told, hey, you're going to take over this fire team. And uh, it wasn't all welcome aboard, was it? A- absolutely not, absolutely not. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit, at the time, um, I had just over three and a half years in the Army, um, but I had no experience in the Ranger Regiment. And not only that, I had no experience in my new job. I was, I'm was i an infantryman now, but I came right out of infantry school, went straight to the Ranger Indoctrination Program, immediately to pre-Ranger, and then Ranger School, and then got assigned to the 2nd Ranger Battalion. So I have just school. essentially just school experience, no yes. real-world, tangible experience for me to draw from. So there's a little bit of that going on in my head at the time. You know, I've, I've got no experience. Um, and then I get there and it's just like, uh, you mentioned Fred, it was, um, it, there were no, there, no one gave me a hug when I walked through that door and I wasn't expecting hugs, but it was more difficult than what I, what I could have imagined. And, um, the, the bottom line was, was I set this goal for myself. I wanted to be a ranger, and I was going to stay the course. And it, you know, this was the very first time in my life where I was truly challenged, where my purpose, and, and I had to show my personal resolve yes. to see this through, that I was not going to quit. And I, I think that's what I want all the listeners out there to, to understand, is you, you can't hold heartedly commit to something and then back out just because things get a little bit difficult. You have to see it through. Whether you succeed or fail, see it through the end. That would be my advice. In what you mentioned, it was from reading your book, 
I would interpret it as not just a one word like difficult. You know, you, you were first assigned to this one squad and they basically outright didn't want you there because you were you had no prior infantry or ranger experience. And a lot of those guys, like in the recon community in the Marine Corps, we call it recon babies. They had grown up in that ranger regiment as privates and they basically waited their turn for three years. And now, and so you get passed from one you know, squad, you know, they said, Hey, we don't basically want you here after you'd been assigned to that you're taking over this team. Then they send you over to this other squad. And a lot of people in, in business world, you know, because you're, you're checking in the Rangers, you're thinking, I'm finally here at an operational Ranger unit. I'm going to do something cool. People have seen, you know, recruiting videos or it was somehow sold to us through, there's not a ton of books as much as there are on Navy SEALs as there are on the Rangers, but but they have that recruiting stuff that makes you think that, you know, you're going to be coming in at boats at night, you know, camming up and your your first day off the bat, again, it's it's not just difficult. It's very demoralizing. You went, you had a very bad experience like day one or one, one squad, you know, they were basically sabotaging you. You go to the other, it was somewhat the same to include your own roommate, you know, basically you know, forcing you to sleep on the floor. And he was almost trying to do what he could to demoralize and make you, you quit. Now, the reason I bring all that up and I'd like to talk, have you talk about how you felt about it, as well as your advice to others who, you know, maybe check into a new job. They think it's going to be great. You know, they're, they're with a big name company like you were with the Rangers. They're excited about it. And right from the bat, straight from the get-go, everybody's pulling the carpet out from underneath them. How did you feel and how did you deal with that, Rob? Yeah. And I didn't feel good. <laughs> It'd probably right. be a good way to describe it. It was and you're exactly right. Uh difficult is probably sugarcoating uh what was happening to me. And it, it didn't just last a day, it lasted several months. And um because you're right, Fred, it, at the time, um, just like uh um I for, I forget the term used, the recon babies. Really yes. Good. And and life in the Ranger Regiment, as a as a private, is very very difficult, and I, I never experienced that. So essentially, I hadn't earned my right to be a leader in that organization. And um, am I saying what they did was justified? No, but at the time, I needed to realize that I had to earn their respect because this is this is not um, or that this unit that I was in was not uh you know corporate america this is a unit that is fixated on and and not fixated but plans and executes operations to win in war and um so that's what they were doing they needed to see the character of my backbone and to make sure that i was one not going to quit being a ranger and essentially quit the unit and and my fellow teammates, and two, I had the 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 fortitude to see the process through the end. When you're describing that, there's two things that you know really stand out. Is and you cover them very well in your book, and I'd like you to expound a little bit more. Is you knew that there was you know a deficiency in real world experience and leadership in the Ranger regiments that they had. And even though you wore the rank as a fire team leader, so because of that, and you didn't have to have anybody rub it in your face, even though people were doing that, but you set out to do everything, not just as best you could, but to perfection. You you exceeded the standards, and that's, you know, your Ranger Creed. I mean, you really lived in, I mean, an organization that has a creed, that's kind of like, a, you know, a very religious, like a monk. And, and you took that, and you embodied it. You were like, I want to do everything as best I possibly can. And I want you to talk about that as well as you described some of these, you know, peers that were very difficult with you. But then you started to have others that inspired you, that saw you as a young ranger, you know, doing everything as best you can, both on the enlisted and officer side that were encouraging and and saw things in you that you didn't really even see in yourself. They were encouraging you to try out to become, you know, the Ranger of the Year for, 
you know, your battalion and then eventually all the way up to the entire Ranger Regiment. And if we talk about those two things, first of all, you know, that how you decided I am going to give this everything I've got. And even though that, you know, you may not have improved, you know, it's not a turnaround in a single day, but it was a long-term process. But eventually, and you didn't do it out of selfish reasons, but your superiors, they recognize that. And and you sort of saw yourself, and I, from reading it, knowing you, you're a very humble man. I think sometimes it's easy to sell ourselves short, but others saw that, like, Rob Trevino is not just a hard worker and a quick learner and takes a lot of initiative and has a lot of organizational skills, but he is somebody that we see as a future leader. And and they began to require you to, you know, look at yourself in a little bit different light that you didn't even, you didn't at that time, you know, perceive that, you know, hey, I do have this potential. Can you talk about those two things that I just mentioned? Absolutely. Um so it's just like you said, Fred, I, my goal at that point in time after uh, I got my my feet underneath me, if you will, after a few months, I had some training events underneath my belt and, and I essentially got my confidence that I needed that one, yes, I, I can do what's asked of me um, while I'm in this organization and two, I, I'm going to do the best that I can. So I... My goal was to learn as much as I could, as fast as I can, and not just to learn it, but to perfect it. And I think um, that alone is kind of what set, set me apart. And eventually, um, just like you said, after a couple of years of being in the Ranger Regiment, within my company, most of the leaders knew me, um, just because they probably knew that I would try it and do everything that they told me, whether I was raking gravel again or, you know, planning a, a squad operation or doing pre-jump training for, for a, a parachute and fill. Um, I was going to do the best that I could and live up to the Ranger Creed as best as I could. And um, when we're in those positions as the individual, we don't think about um, other aspects. We're just in the moment trying yes. to do the best that we can. So it's our leader's responsibility to kind of um, uh, look out for us. And that's exactly what my leader did at the time. He says, hey, I think this guy has potential. I'm going to task him or ask him to do this thing for me. And, um, and, and that's how I got involved with, with going through and, 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 and becoming the, the Ranger Regiment, uh, Regimental NCO of the Year. And um, I wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, ego thing. It wasn't a. Um, it wasn't a uh, uh, something that I wanted to do. Essentially, my platoon sergeant brought me in and said, "Hey, Sergeant Trevino, we'd like you to try out for for the the battalion NCO of the year competition." My initial response was no. And he says, "Sergeant Trevino, do you actually believe that you are worse than every other?" sergeant in this battalion and he made me think right in a way that i had never thought about myself before and that's where leadership comes in he made me do that i would never would have thought that before and after thinking a couple of minutes i said sergeant you're right i'm i can be as good or better than any of these sergeants in this battalion i'm going to give it a shot yes often it is important for somebody to you know you know, give us that eagle leadership and toss us outside our nest and see their fly or die and to, to believe that, you know, like, okay, yeah, I can do this, but, you know, they're tossing you out of the nest. That's right. You, you got you to gotta demonstrate. And, and that's, that's great that you have leaders that did that. And also in your book, Rob, you mentioned <clears throat> a couple other things that, you know, because your response and you, you talk about it, so you're reflecting and people ask you that and you kind of, you know, I, I kind of like, where you're at, you're in that comfort zone. You, you talk in your book some of these, you know, very natural, authentic experiences that, you know, like any uh, infantryman, you know, you you like some off duty time to relax a little bit and to you know drink some beers with some friends off duty after hours, and those are those are natural things. But you know, these people were seeing you for future leadership. But what I'd like to ask you uh, two questions is, you know, to be 
a successful, you know, key leader in the Rangers, you do have to have a strong mind and a body, but you also have to have some kind of balance uh, because I've, we've both seen guys who, you know, they are the most physically fit and they may even study a lot of military skills and knowledge, but oftentimes it's a lot of times strictly for themselves and to the purpose of advancing their career and getting ahead, but uh, they don't have the people and the communication skills and they don't have a lifestyle that takes them and challenges them in other areas, you know, off duty. They have no balance, Uh, kind of, you know, one or two dimensional. And how important is it to have that off? I mean, it's very important for you to focus and like, and have other people encourage you to, you know, concentrate in certain areas, but you also had a life where, you had an off-duty life, and uh, there was a balance. And how important wasn't was that not just while you're in the Rangers, but throughout the rest of your career? Yeah, absolutely right. I, not so much in the Ranger Regiment that it, it, later on in my career, when I became a, a, went to the Special Missions Unit, I realized that that balance is critical in everything that we do. Um, I understand now that I am a person who. I want to be an individual who brings justice to the wrongdoer. I can't imagine a world filled with people exactly like me. There has to be somebody else out there who strives for peace. Because a world with someone filled with people just like me, it it would be too difficult to live in. So there's got to be balance. There's got to be a a yin and a yang. I, I understand now that there's, to take it a step further... There's got to be balance while you're working with this talk specifically about skill set. You've got to be a leader has to be a good speaker, a good manager, understand human emotion, be socially connected, emotionally connected with human beings. If you want to be super effective on the off duty side, you've got to have balance at home, whether you have family or not. Somebody knows somebody. Yes. And you've got to incorporate that balance into your life yes. you can't the sword cannot just lay on one side it's got to be upright in order for it to be upright it's got to be balanced on both sides and um it's very very important to understand that the sooner you can wrap your head around that i think the better or sooner you'll become a more effective leader because yes. your subordinates see you not only when you're next to them directing them they learn and see of what you do when you're not working. Yes. This is very critical. If you want to be a whole, um, a, a great leader as opposed to just a good leader. Yes. And it's at that stage while you're in the Rangers that you started to assume a leadership responsibility and you won the Ranger of the year for the entire regiment. So people viewed you as, you know, a leader who had, who possessed a lot of strengths and capabilities and when you look at that point and throughout the rest of your career in the Army, there's, there's a lot of people that have leadership examples or there's books you can buy on how to be a leader and people talk and write a ton about leadership. And it's good to have ideas and perspectives of those, but it has to be authentic. And can you give your two cents on you know, how important it is to be an authentic, not to try to emulate, you know, you can take, you know, an idea or, you know, you know, type of style from somebody, but if you try to imitate and show that, you know, people, a young infantryman picks up on something that's counterfeit real quick. Super fast. Absolutely. Yes. And how was, how important was that into those listeners out there that are in a leadership role to, to be completely, yourself to have you know you have ideas come from other areas but you still have to be yourself absolutely um it, it was it was when i was a leader in the ranger regiment i was a squad leader i realized that i wanted my leadership ability to be grounded in my character i wanted to be who i was and and that's how i was going to lead i wanted to lead the people around me the way I wanted to be led. I, so I, you know, and we learn through our culture and the environment that we're tossed in. 
and I made some mistakes along the way, and it took me a little while to figure out what I wa- how I wanted to lead. And essentially, it, it came to a point where I, I, I can still remember being in my barracks room in Alpha Company, and I said, you know what? I need to start leading the way I want to, I want to be led. And um, the, the basis or the foundation for my leadership was, is my character. I, I wanted my people to follow me because I am a good person. And, and because I'm going to work hard because I'm a good person. And I'm going to do the right thing because of my character. And I knew as soon as I mortgaged my integrity for personal gain, they would see it. And then that would erode my leadership um, foundation that I had created or wanted to create at the time. So that's where it started for me. You know, I said, you know, I'm go- I want to be the best squad leader I can be. At the time, there was, um, I'm sure in the Marine Corps, they have certain terms that they use to kind of drive young individuals to be leaders. At the time, it was, you need to be technically and tactically proficient. Yes. And, um, and I took that to heart as a young leader in, in the Ranger Regiment. But I also realized I need to be a, a good person a moral character. So that's how it started for me. Yes. And one of those things is you began to advance in your career that often does not become recognized, but is it's an additional time requirement. It's opportunity cost that you have to give of yourself when you're developing, not just an individual, but an organization. And we do it in the military. And I know you did it through, several processes. One's called after action reports or after action reviews. And another one is called uh, standard operating procedures. And these are things that some people take for granted. It's like walking into a building without understanding that somebody put some thought into where the workspace is and where the facilities are, this and that. But you actually spent a lot of time uh, developing a lot of these after action so that people could be more effective, more efficient, so it could improve how you did your job and the survivability of the men. And how important was that to you? And and please describe a little bit of the extra time that went in after the work day and ever, after everybody's left that it takes to, to develop those reports and procedures. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the after action review is, is the most underutilized and most effective tool yes. that any organization can use. Um, just like I said before, um, I didn't automatically just um, come up with the best ideas. It was trial and error. Yes. I made a lot of mistakes. And in those mistakes, you have to be brutally honest. Brutally honest. You can't sugarcoat it. And, and, and try to collectively come together as an organization to solve those problems. And, and it... And as the leader, you have to be the individual who follows through to ensure that we don't make those mistakes again. Because if I, I've been in many, many, many different organizations after action reviews, and, and most times it's just talking. And the leaders forget the most critical aspect of the after action review, and that's following through yes. with, with the identified um, solutions to the problems. And that's that's your goal, to find solutions to pro- identified problems and collectively determine a way forward. Yes. Yeah. So, so to continue just a little bit, um, I've realized, you know, after spending many, many years in special missions unit, the, particularly in that unit and only in that unit, have they mastered the after action review. And that's where I've learned to be quite honest with you. We did the after action reviews in the Ranger Regiment and in and my other army units, but it wasn't until I was assigned and participated in after action reviews and the special mission unit where I realized that it's, it's effectiveness and, and how how to effectively and correctly run one yes. and, and with an outcome and to plan for them. And just like you said, it requires a lot of extra work. Yes. But you'll reap, I am guarantee you, you will reap the rewards if you do your after-action reviews correctly. Yes, and what Rob is explaining here is the time and what he physically and mentally spent on developing 
the organization which he had served in and throughout those times. But he mentioned, you know, that they did it in you know the conventional army and in the Ranger Regiment and the Special Missions Unit. And you can go through sort of the motions. And if you want to be politically correct and tell people what they want to hear, you're going to have a certain outcome. But if you know the expectation of that outcome of the standard operating procedure or an after action report is that your unit, you know, has the greatest effect in doing what their mission is and increasing the survivability, then you have to, you can't be politically correct and you have to be brutally honest. And it is going to take that leader and those leaders a lot of time. But what I just described and he mentioned is something that no matter if you're working at a startup in Silicon Valley, you're working at a medium-sized business in the Midwest, or you're working for you know, a Fortune 100 company in New York City, if you're not spending that time to reflect and analyze and put it into writing and challenging and pushing that out so that others don't just hear about it, but they are driven by a leader with set goals on how to improve, then you're not operating at your full potential and you're not at that level of a tier one you know, corporate entity. And it takes leaders and there's those that are sitting there listening to this thinking like, you know, what's he talking about? You know, you, you must follow through with what we're talking about and you, you can drive your organization to have greater results, but it takes a lot of faith and follow through to, to faith to understand that vision that you can do it and follow through that I'm going to take the time. Six, 12 months later, I'm going to see where I'm at, but I'm not just going to do this once and it'll be over with. But, uh, Speaking of that, and let's talk about the next topic is when when you tried out for the Rangers, you know you saw something that uh, when you're in the conventional 18th Airborne Corps, you know you saw the Rangers as some elite unit that had a very high standard, um, and you were impressed by that. What set that spark in you? You know, you, here you worked your way up to the top of the operational level in a ranger regiment, you were voted to, you know, by your peers and your superiors to be the ranger of the year, uh, you know, squad leader, you know, very accomplished in a very challenging unit. Now, what led you to want to try out for a special missions unit? What started that? Uh, I think that there were several things that, um, that pushed me in that direction, and looking back at it now, that that all really didn't matter. They were just external tangibles that I had to deal with. But at, when I set my goal to leave the 18th Airborne Corps and and to go to the 75th Ranger Regiment, my goal was to be in the best unit I could be in. And when I realized that there was a special mission unit out there, because I I didn't know, um, that seemed like the natural progression, and um. I realized that it wasn't going to be an easy path. Um, I realized that I could, more than likely, the odds were against me. The vast majority of the individuals who try out for a special missions unit fail. And it doesn't mean that they're bad soldiers. It means that they just didn't, didn't make it in. So at a point in my career as a squad leader in the Ranger Regiment, I, I that set that as my goal. I'm going to try with the understanding that I may fail or I may succeed, I was going to see it through the end. And that, and that was this, that was a spark. I think the spark that started me on my path to becoming a ranger uh, also set me on the path to go to the special missions unit. Uh, just the desire to be in the best unit that I could be in. Yes. And that's a unit that, like we just spoke about, they have after action review and they have refined that and incorporate that into their selection of how they select the personnel. So that unit is known for having the most rigorous and challenging selection in the entire department of defense here in the United States, as well as, you know, when you went through that, describe how one, you trained for it, but then two, when you experience the selection, I mean, you have to go have the understanding of you're not just going to give your utmost, but you have to push your mind and your body past complete, you know, mental and muscular exhaustion. I mean, you're you're doing something 
I mean, you have to have it in your heart. If you're trying out for a unit like that, it can't be a number two or three or four on your checklist of things to do. It has to be something you want with every cell in your body. Is that right, Rob? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. If, if, if your listeners out there listening to us right now um, saw me walking down the street, you would never guess that I was in a special missions unit, much less a leader in, in, in the U.S. US Army special mission unit. I just don't fit the mold. I'm five foot nothing, um, 150 pounds of nothing. And the, the reality was mentally and physically we're capable of doing it. There was, but you have to have the heart to do it. Yes. Yeah, it has to be the total package. You've got to be physically capable, but and you've got to prepare for it. You have to be mentally tough to deal with the situation that you're getting tossed in, and you have to have a wholehearted approach to the process. But without a doubt, now granted, um, it, in that organization there are um, it's it's the NFL, if you will, of of the military. And there are individuals there that possess just unique physical capabilities, as you might imagine. But they all have the heart to be there as well. And that's, what, that's what's going to drive you when you're yes. physically and mentally essentially destroyed. Yes. And your heart is what's going to keep you going. Yes. And that's, relaying my own personal experiences, that's what it was for me. Yes. And a lot of those listeners out there, you know, they figure out oh, how it's hard. You know, it's, it's just trying to do your best. It, it also relates to the purpose. And in a unit like the one you served in, you have to understand and you have to feel in, in your spirit that, you know, that is what my purpose is here on earth. And that doesn't always come just on your own. Some people are gifted to understand, like, this is what God created me to do, to do this job. Uh, other people, you know, need reinforcement from their leadership to understand, like, this is our purpose. They need that clear. And it's not wrong if if you're one of those people that, you know, has to, you know, have that reinforced to where you fully understand and accept. And, an, and a unit cannot be an exceptional unit, uh, in my experience, that has, you know, 50% of more people that do not understand that their purpose is to do what they're, you know, organized to do. And Rob, would you explain how important it is for a leader to instill that sense of purpose to all those that are serving in that unit or organization? Absolutely, absolutely critical skill um, or, or necess- necessary skill for leaders to, to do. Um, just to relay a, a little bit of a, um, a, a story that I Experienced while I was uh, deployed in Iraq, um, operating with a uh, a conventional army unit, and the young soldier that I was speaking with at a at a checkpoint kept asking, "What are we doing here? Why why are we doing this?" So his leader essentially made him do something without giving him a purpose. So if this poor individual is asking himself, why are we doing this? I'm just going through the motions. I'm following orders. Yes. Did that particular leader do anything wrong? Not necessarily, but he didn't do things as best as he could, or he or she could. I, I don't know what the individual's leader um, was. But um, the bottom line is it's the leader's responsibility yes. to, to provide purpose so that the individual can draw and, and create personal resolve in what they're yes. doing. There's got to be a reason, a good reason, and I have to believe in it yes. to go forward. Yes. And it's easy to, to have resolve when I put my pants on in the morning. That, that, that requires zero resolve. Right. It's when things get really tough for those in the, in the military, when things um, start to fall apart, you see your friends next to you fall down and get hurt, get shot, that's not the time to think about personal resolve that should have been instilled in you already. And that should be the leader's responsibility to do that. 
if the individual doesn't, hasn't done it already. So very, very, very important. Very important to do that. And it, it should be an, on, an ongoing process for, yes. for those leaders. It shouldn't just come in, you know, oh, okay, it's been six months. I got to talk about why we're here. No, d- tell your individuals. They're smart, capable individuals. Explain it to them. This yes. is why we're doing it. Obviously, there, there will be times where you can't do that. You know, time yes. to compress time schedule, et cetera. But if you have the time, explain it to them so that they can create that resolve in themselves to push forward when things get bad. In one particular, to reinforce what Rob had just mentioned, I'll use an example, <clears throat> not to bring any shame on anybody, and I won't men- mention the unit, but uh, there's a time when we were both in Iraq in 2005, um, you know, Marine Infantry Unit uh, just south of Haditha Dam had some snipers employed, and they, it was hot, desert, summertime. Uh, but what he's talking about, that sense of purpose it what it's it's difficult to to constantly follow through when it's hot. You're limited on water. You're out there long duration. You're doing something, you know, observing personnel. Some of which could be the enemy can sometimes be monotonous. And he and I have both experienced this, where you just have to you know you have to fixate on what you're there to do. And if you don't understand that bigger purpose, you can very easily compromise. And what happened to this team? Um, you know, they ended up falling asleep and the enemy capitalized on that and they went and they, they shot and killed all those snipers Two try attempted to run away and one was shot and killed and the other was captured. And, uh, later on, uh, men from your organization went to recover the body, but, it, you know, they, they captured him, tortured him and, uh, uh, also captured all the sniper team's equipment. So unless you understand your purpose, even though it's serious and people get hyped up, but that's where the leadership every single day cannot compromise and has to follow through, and has to lead by example, and has to show that he is in it or she is in it 100%, uh, that it's not something that people get excited about or that purpose just becomes something else that people do. And it can... In the military, it can lead to death. In a business, it can also lead to something catastrophic for the whole business and everybody that's, that's employed there has jobs that provide for their family. If you are, if you don't understand that purpose, it can be very detrimental. Rob, if you would talk about some of those experiences that you saw when you were in your military career, where somebody, you know, used their authority to kind of overlord over people. And, and you had mentioned that already, but what I'd like to ask is for that person that's on the receiving end of that, you know, doesn't feel good. Um, how did you either deal with it or how would you looking back and reflecting on that recommend that somebody can take that negative and influence a leader? I mean, it, it can't be turned around or you just have to suck it up. Is there any way that you've seen that, you know, you can, as a subordinate, you can change a senior leader that's just not a little abusive, but, you know, just downright demoralizing. Yeah, that's, that's difficult. Um, it's been my experience. If you're dealing with an individual like that, that that's essentially part of their personality. And, um, if, if the leader is not open to recommendations from subordinates, it's an uphill battle. It it really is. And, um, and a lot of times um, you can be um, uh, cut down for trying to help your leader. And that's all you're trying to do is you're trying to help that particular individual become a better leader. Yes. But it's been my experience that most times those types of leaders are insecure right. and, and not open-minded enough to realize that the subordinate is coming to you because he or she is trying to help not just you, but the culture and the environment that his or her subordinates are in. Yes. And it's toxic. If it gets to that point where a subordinate has to approach it, it, let's say you're the leader and your subordinates have approached you, it's a significant issue, one that needs to be addressed. So if that happens to you as the leader, listen 
And, and if more than one person is saying it, it's probably true. Yes. If you're the, the subordinate approaching the, your leader, you've got to be smart. You have to be super smart because you can find yourself in hot water pretty fast. On the military side, it can be it's fairly you know um, um, not difficult to do that because one of one of two things will happen: you'll get yelled at again, and then you'll be sent on your way. Or two, you'll you'll get reassigned. On on the civilian side, you could lose your job, so that's a lot more significant. So just be smart. Take the look at the individual. And determine an approach, do your homework, have a plan when you go and, and push forward. If a group setting is better, what I mean by that is taking your leader and bringing a group of people in and discussing the issues with him or her at that time, as opposed to coming by yourself. You've got to look at all those angles. But the, the bottom line is you can find yourself in hot water really, really fast. Yes. So. And Rob, you've been in organizations that had an exceptional screening and selection process. So they, they screen people to meet, make sure they have the basic requirements to be in that organization. And then they put them through a very rigorous selection process that tests them and does something that you mentioned that allows them to see their character. You mentioned that is, you know, and you can only do that effectively after you put them under some stress. Uh, so what would your recommendation be to organizations that, you know, they've, they've allowed certain individuals to come into that organization and they can, they can see a little bit about who they are, but now it's time to select them for leadership positions. And how would you recommend if, if I'm at ABC company and you're consulting me, what would be some of those things be to look at people to, especially to screen out uh, people who have demonstrated selfish behaviors or some things that are, as you mentioned, could become toxic. Uh, what would you recommend to some things to look for when they're looking across their organization? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and this is a huge, huge topic um, with regards to leadership and just making organizations better. The, the two measuring sticks that the corporate world uses to hire individuals, one, education. You know, did said individual go to a good school and did said individual earn good grades? Two, skill set. Does this individual bring the, the type of skills that we need to put him or her directly into the workforce and to be productive? I, I think that's backwards, in my, my personal opinion. I think all organizations, military and corporate America, civilian world, whatever you want to call it, should focus on the things that you can't teach. One, as an example, you cannot teach a hard work ethic. Yes. You can't teach it. You cannot teach someone to be self-disciplined. And self-disciplined is when you as an individual can, will do everything, the correct thing, all the time without someone being on your shoulder. Yes. You can't teach that. Right. They have to understand there's a problem and comply and make that change in themselves. It's something that has to be self-driven. Exactly right. So these are the things that I would recommend you focus on during your hiring process for upper management leadership and even at entry level. Because I can teach anybody to, to pound a couple of letters if they have the cognitive ability to do that. I can teach them that, but I can't teach them to do the work while they're at work. Yes, Unless I have someone watching them continually. Does yes. that make sense? It does. And I think you described it in your book, as you mentioned, in you know, A Warrior's Path, that here you're at the Special Missions Unit, and it was a radical change from the Ranger Regiment because there was, in the military, we called, there was a lot of things called specified tasks that you have to accomplish, you know, A, B, and C to this standard, and that's specified in writing, uh, now, there's other things called implied tasks, and one of those in your special missions unit was the implied task of do the right thing. And some people may you know, try to fluff that off and say, well, that's, that's very idealistic. 
that that goes to the organizational culture, that that wasn't just a, you know, a banner that was on a board in an office somewhere. That was something that you guys took to heart, you know, to always, and it, it, it requires that leaders themselves lead by example with the idea that, you know, their purpose and their mission is larger than themselves and their, their, their self role that they have to see them. And, and it goes counter to our American culture in today's day and age where everybody's talking that, you know, you have to show your merits, do this to get ahead, you know, show your education to, for, for yourself. It's kind of a narcissistic or self-promotion. Not that everybody's like that, but you know, in that unit, you do have to subordinate yourself and see that, I mean, you're, you know, we've both been in these units where we have to fully understand that what our job entails, you know, would possibly require our life. Uh, our life may be required in the in training as well as in combat. We have to understand that and that we are we are not, you know, the one being served. You know, just like you know, it talks about in the Bible. Jesus was there to serve other people. You know, here uh, we have to get that in our heads as well. Uh, and that that requires, you know, a lot. And I wanted you to, you know, talk about how in your unit, in your book, you mentioned a lot of things were driven by just that one, you know, it was not a mission phrase, but it was an ideal of do the right thing. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. And it was just to add a little bit about my culture shock, if you will, leaving the Ranger Regiment and going to a unit where I am not just asked to do the right thing, I'm expected to do it. And and just being given that autonomy and, and trust to do that yes. and to be expected to do that all the time. It was awesome. It was, it was like uh, someone flipped the switch and all of a sudden I felt free and I was liberated because I didn't have... Um, to go and ask permission to do something, I just had to do what was right. Yes. Based on the situation in front of me. Very and autonomous. Absolutely right. And that's one of the core foundational um, uh, ideas that separates that unit from every, everywhere else. So there's, there's a handful of them, but that's probably one of them, is you are expected to do the right thing yes. all of the time under all conditions. And it's not just morally; it's tactically and and physically. I mean, you're you're given a lot of rope, and it's you know I'm not trying to speak for your particular unit. You know, like mine, it was we look for those people with initiative, and even down to the mission. Uh, one of the overlying principles is initiative based tactics. You have to train people that you know they're they're trained in the special skill, but they are going to follow through, even though it has potential lethal impacts to themselves. They're going to do the right thing. Hey, this, this may not make logical sense to me, but I'm going to do it. You know, I have a fallen comrade. I'm going to shield him or get him out of that fire, or I'm going to find a way to, you know, eliminate whoever's firing at us. But uh, you're always, you know, driven by that and to use, you know, your talents and your brains to, to deliver make that good. Right, right. And I think that um, most organizations can can create a culture where that where they can have that idea or that ideal as part of their foundation within their culture. Um, and it, it, it would be it wouldn't be an easy task for an organization. Yes. I mean, you'd have to create the culture and establish some left and right limits to get people to move in the proper direction. Yes. But once it's there yes. and the people realize, you know, how, how great it is, then it's there to stay. Yes. And now you have a not just a few unique experiences. I mean, you have a career of incredible proven track records, and I'm here to tout it for him because he will never do it. <laughs> but one of those, I mean, and he will never tell how— special he feels, but I, he obviously had to feel, you know, you did something great in winning the 75th Ranger Regiment. We only have, there's not 74 other ones. There's only one Ranger Regiment in the United States military, but you won the Ranger of the Year, you know, nominated, you know, from the leadership of the United States Army Rangers. But then now you go into a special missions unit and you're 
like you mentioned before, you're in the pros. This is the big leagues, and you're one of many. There's people who have far superior physical skills, and you're in an organization that just because they've had more time and experience and training, they've got these special skills that are literally off the charts, whether that's free fall parachuting, whether that's sniping, whether that's specialized demolition and blowing things up. I mean, these people are far advanced. And then you're, you're working with, you know, these elite units in other, from other nations, the British. And I mean, it's, it's kind of, my point is it can be daunting. And if you would first talk about, you know, how, how your sense in that was like, you know, how that made you feel. And then, you know, to some, what your recommendations is the second part of it, what you would recommend to somebody else that they join, you know, they become a trader on the floor of the New York stock exchange and they feel like they're over their head. You know, how do you develop goals to, you know, have that faith and drive you to operate effectively in an organization is the, is the new guy, the rookie. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great question. Cause there's a, there's a, a, I had a commander explain the transformation of the unit member and it, it was brilliant. He said, you know, it's great to see the, the people here. You know, you'll come in from a graduate of, of the training course to your new uh, operational unit. You get here and you're all ears. Everybody's quiet and you learn. That's phase one. Phase two is you realize you can hang with the NFL now. Right. And you get cocky. Mm-hmm. So there's a the transition there. You know, I, I can... I've been here a couple of years. I've done my thing. I'm good to go. I can hang with these guys. We get comfortable and we get a little bit cocky until someone crushes us. And then eventually we mature into the quiet professional leader. And um, so as the individual, I can share my initial experience coming in and kind of how I dealt with things. One, you know, I I realized I wasn't going to come in there and, and win everybody over and, and beat everybody at everything. And, and bottom line, I wanted to come in and do the best that I could with the understanding that I didn't have all the experiences that, that, that my peers had. But what was great about the culture there was they understood that. And they wanted nothing more than to help me. Right. It was awesome. It was, in, it was just an incredible experience that it came into the organization and it was just, all right. But there was a little bit of testing initially because it's a requirement. You come in, you, you've got to, you know, they, the leaders there want to see where you're at and where, where they need to take you. Yes. And yeah. um, so on the, from that aspect, um, it, it was easy for me, to be honest with you, because there's a unique culture within that environment. Yes. And um, it, it's not a good old boy. I wasn't in because I had just graduated. They were there to help me yes. succeed. There, there's a difference. Yes. You know, uh, some of the guests and if the listeners recall back to some of these uh, earlier podcasts with uh, Dave Blassingame or Darren Hamilton, two uh, Marine peers of mine, friends, both Marine Cobra attack helicopter pilots. Uh, they grew up not just in a culture and the Marine Cobra community, that attack helicopter pilot community is known to be vicious. And that particular squadron they both served in, which will remain nameless, is known to their own phrases to eat their own. And so, Rob, would you, if you're consulting someone, that's not a good environment to you know, have the senior guys you know, just constantly you know, finding every single way, not trying to help, but trying to you know, kind of show how smart or awesome they are by by crushing the young guys and never letting those guys up for error that's you don't see that for the good of the organization or or how would you see a culture that tries to eat its own like that? no i wouldn't recommend that if i were to come in and and help help anybody create a better organization it's counterproductive um to say the least yes. especially if you're the guy on the bottom right yes. And you said you help, you know, your culture was that everybody is there to help you, not to crush you. Yeah. And that there are, you know, there's an aspect of competitiveness, obviously, right. and, and that's there for sure, right? All um, 
just great, great uh, uh, individuals at what they do. And um, so that that is there. But at the end of the day, everybody has to be comfortable with the fact that tomorrow I could be next to him and, and we could be in a bad way. Yes. So that was the overarching um, uh, uh, not situation, but the, 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 the message at the end of the day was, hey, we're here. Yes. Tomorrow we may not be. Tomorrow might be a bad day. Right. And we need to push forward and everybody working together to make it through that next day. Yes. And Robin, in your book, you mentioned how after multiple deployments in combat, starting in Afghanistan, you were the first, you were one of the, your unit selected you yourself and allowed you to take one other person to be the first uh, warriors on the ground from your unit. And then you were the first on the ground in Iraq. Um, and then you mentioned, you know, after several years of fighting, and now the time period is 2006, even with all that experience, it was difficult to, in that particular time and location, to find some of those threats. They were not easily presenting themselves. Some of the easier targets, you know, the lower level, you know, the dumb guys had all been killed off. People fled, you know, which is a positive sign that we're, we're having an effect. But, you know, my question is, for those leaders in an organization, it doesn't have to be military. It could be, you know, the business world. You know, those leaders have to be, you know, not a step ahead, but literally 10 steps ahead. They have to think like their competitors or sometimes, you know, in the corporate world, you have to think like your customers and what they're going to want next. You know, before, you know, people had iPhones. I mean, there's somebody that thought like, I want this thing. This thing can be very helpful for me. And, uh, but it's not something that existed. Um, I mean, they had cell phones, sure, but not the technology that's combining everything, a camera, a calendar, you know, everything together. But you literally, like those innovators, have to be 10 steps ahead. Uh, but you struggled with it for a while. You mentioned in your book, in A Warrior's Path, you you talk about in 06, I mean, you'd been in combat for over half a decade. Uh, in that entire time, I mean, let's just talk about it. In your book, you mentioned that, uh, I mean, you wanted to get down to the molecular level. Uh, before you deployed to Afghanistan, you and some of your comrades, you know, you were training and you spent time at Ground Zero in New York City. I mean, you understood the enemy, what what is driving them. Um, but if you would talk about how you must, as a leader, to be competitive, whether it's military or whether it's the corporate world, to understand what as a leader should to see the unseen and see what's beyond the horizon, how you have to, con and it takes a lot of time to spend doing critical thinking to analyze and predict those emerging threats and what is needed, you know, to, to continue and advance the mission. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just as a, to put it a little bit into perspective to add a little bit, what you, what you just said is a, uh, the reason why I was selected to to be um, the first person to deploy to Afghanistan but within my small unit within the larger organization was I had a, a, a fairly unique skill set. I was in a sniper for a long time, and I was very, very proficient with our communications gear. Because I, I knew at the time that it, if I'm forward of the lines as a in, in a sniper or reconnaissance role, and I got into a problem with just a small group of guys, the only way I would get help was to call, right? to use, to use my communications gear. So I wanted to be, and that, and that, I just, it's not that I was the best at what it was, and then that's why I was picked. The bottom line is I was, I had a unique skill set. And any one of the guys within my organization could, should and could have gone initially in place in my stead, but... Um, Nonetheless, I was selected, and I, I picked uh, uh, someone else to go with me. And um, so being able to see forward, I'm going into a very ambiguous situation. What, you know, up to this point, prior to September 11th, there wasn't a whole lot going on. 
there was, but not near the scale that we see nowadays. So I wasn't sure what to do. What do I train on? What, what equipment do I take? What um, do we need vehicles? There's just so much. So I had to, instead of, before I had this perception in my mind of what I thought conflict would be. And it was nothing as, as, as what I, I had pictured in my mind. I said, so what can I do? One, I have to be able to communicate. So I, I basically, instead of looking forward, I came back and said, if I can execute these core skills, yes. these simple tasks, effectively, you can put me into any situation and I'll be successful. I don't need a special piece of gear. I don't need anything outrageous. I just need to execute core skills near flawlessly all of the time under every situation, whether it be stressful or not, we will be successful. So I went full circle. Now, going back to your question, how important it is to to project and, and to think forward, absolutely, you must, must do that in order to prepare yourself and the people either above you or below you absolute necessary in the corporate world you got to have a vision and you got to establish achievable goals to get to that vision whether it's to bring a new product online or just to sustain and 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 you know work for your people yes and if you don't look ahead and make a plan to achieve that vision that you have set out for yourself or your organization you'll never get there yes and that's the bottom line yes and one of those things is, you know, your unit had a lot of fiscal resources to do that, but not necessarily so much when you're in the Rangers, but to keep, you know, your, to keep an elite unit elite, they have to be thinking creativity, cre- creatively. Um, and as a leader, you have to be challenging them with realistic training that isn't always the same repetitive, you know, we're going to go out in the backyard and, and do the same thing. And how did you as a leader, you know, take the time, you know, before guys are ever going to the field? I mean, you have to do a lot of planning to, and you train all over the, the country and around the globe in, in years before uh, the war started. But how did you plan to sh- keep the knife's edge sharp the entire time with this outside the box or creative thinking as a leader? Yeah, they... It was simple in, the, in my special mission unit. It was the culture that really drove our mindset. And, and, but just with the understanding that today was great, tomorrow might not be. Yes. And, and that, was, that was more than just an idea. It was reality to yes. us. And that's how we viewed it. So that mindset and the culture is what separated or separates that unit from every other organization that I've ever worked with, yes. whether it be civilian law enforcement or military. Yes. And, and on the military side, until you truly understand the, the realities of your you know, chosen profession, if you go through uh, your work day and you're in the military or in the law enforcement community or you're a first responder and death, is theory, you're not in the right mindset. Right. And so that's where the separation is with regards to the special missions unit that I was in and, and everybody else. The culture, the mindset is what really drove what we did and, and how we trained. And on the training aspect, it was even, um, the, it, I don't know if it was genius on purpose or by accident, the training model that they have is really set the stage for uh, the outcome and our successes. And, yes. And number one is w- the way it's done is you train to do a specific task to a set standard. And then you apply that training aspect in a stressful environment. Yes. So what, what I mean by that is, um, let's say shooting, for example, uh, most people in the military and the law enforcement community, first responders can relate to just practicing shooting. Rarely will we just go and practice shooting. It, it, there is more to it than that. If you're a police officer, you have to think and make a decision 
before you press the trigger on your handgun. Right. That must be practiced. Yes. Not just the mechanics of seeing your front sight. Right. So for us, there that was the second piece to the training and probably more important and more significant. To incorporate that duress. Absolutely right. So now when the world is falling apart in the real world out in combat, you're not falling apart with it. Right. You're, There's a decision made before that skill is applied. Absolutely right. Yes. And that's where most organizations don't realize how, if you're training or practicing something and you're comfortable, you're not training correctly. Right. Because when you do it for real, you are not going to be comfortable. Right. So you're not practicing or training correctly. Yes. And that's where most organizations don't realize yes. the difference. I remember one of the British commandos we were training with had this phrase, you know, that a, a mountain leader is supposed to be uncomfortable. And that's why I think, you know, personally, it's it's important. I know one of our deployments we were going on to Iraq, people were questioning, like, well, why are we going to start training in the mountains? And, uh, you know, obviously the mountains induce, you know, with the higher elevation, uh, limited oxygen, it induces a lot of additional stress. And I know your unit would do the same thing. It'd send people to the thing, to area, to train in not just the mountains, but to, you know, work with kayaks and do things that bring us out of our comfort zones. So exactly. People develop this confidence that they can, you know, they can solve the problem. You know, there's there's stress. And I can figure out a way to put my head to it. And then now as a leader, you want to refine how quickly and how soundly they can solve. It could be a simple or a complex problem, but you want to get it that that time narrowed down and, and become very skilled at, you know, what that plan is. Um, speaking of that, you know, in the communities that we had served in, and I want to, I'll probably sound hypocritical in saying this because I just talked about balance and we both <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, at the same side, you know, when, um, when you go into combat and it's not uh, something that you do once or twice um, and then focus on writing books and making movies like some people do, but you, not me, uh, and I'm not talking about your book, Rob, <laughs> but, uh, you know, some people that seems to be their focus, but I want to talk about this gentleman who I knew when they first started up the Marine Special Operations Command. And this is a point in time where, you know, we'd been at war for over half a decade. Uh, lives had been lost. People had lost eyesight, been burned horribly, uh, amputated. You know, it sunk in deep to those of us who had served in not just punched a ticket with a combat deployment, but had faced the enemy, uh, seen an enemy, uh, seen the sweat off an enemy's face as he's firing a weapon at you. It tasted it very closely. Because uh, when they started up this organization, a, a gentleman had talked to me that had a different perspective. He was conventional and he was a combat support, not in a direct combat role. He was a Marine. He said, Fred, you know, your problem is, you know, your, your personal and professional life are one and the same. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're like some of these guys in some of these other organizations that even on their off-duty time, even when they're with friends, they're talking about utilizing, and they even have friends that are helicopter pilots talking about how they're going to get in and get out of the, off the X and how they're going to do this and that. But um, what kind of mindset, you know, if, if you're a leader, a senior leader, uh, one that's going to make the decisions for the health of, not just, I'm not talking about an elite commando unit, but uh, it could be, you know, an upcoming emerging, you know, corporation, uh, that leader, how important is it for him to be fully aligned with, you know, when he or she, you know, puts that, you know, coat on, walks in there and, and is committed, uh, that their, their mind is, is focused, not distracted, but focused on what that purpose is. Absolutely critical. And, um, I think it's crystal clear to, to those of us that, that were in the military, but to add a little bit to that for those who, who, and I'm not saying not being in the military is, is wrong. I, 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 I absolutely believe that uh, you don't have to serve in the military to, to be a great American. You don't have to serve in the military to, uh, to have served your country, just be a great American, and you'll and you'll push forward. But the, 
to get back on track here is, um, yes, you have to have uh, a laser-like focus. And, and yes, it does pour into your off-duty time. It did mine. And, and when we're in that environment and that culture and you were surrounded by your peers during your off-duty time, it, it, it's there. Yes. It's there. And if you don't have that, I would say you're not as driven as you need to be. Right. Now, I'm not saying you have to spend every waking hour um, planning and thinking, so just a little bit of balance, but at the back of your mind, it's it's always in the back of your mind. So there may be phases as you get closer towards a deployment, if you're, say, in the military, or a phase as a business leader where either you're in the startup as it's you know beginning of an organization, or you're about ready to rely launch a project or, you know, prepare an important presentation that at those times you do have to surge and like the Navy says, you know, uh, you know, go to the battle stations. It requires all your time focus and you have to, and you have to train to, you know, be able to, you know, put that amount of time and effort, you know, and intensity into something or, uh, as I've seen, you know, some people have, I don't know if they're doing it out of guilt, but they encourage you to, you know, take a, sh- you know, pop a strap and, you know, take a little weight off your pack and you know, take it easy. I've had so many people say that. And I think what possessed me as a leader was knowing that if I took some of that time off, I mean, this job, again, you know, your life, the lives of those that you're in charge of, America gave you their most precious gift, the, the lives of their sons and daughters. And they're in, the decisions you're going to make, you know, and maybe sometimes you don't, you don't have direct control. I mean, the enemy has a say, but you want to look back and think that, you know, I wish I could have done something better. Uh, it's really important. I, my part is I disagree with that gentleman who, you know, he was, he was a senior leader and he was trying to convince me to, to not be so focused on the organizational mission and, and planning and training men to, you know, go and face the enemy. Next thing, Rob, is a leader in an organization that's in charge of personnel that are doing something very great. And it could be, um, you know, you're, you're coming out with this new robot that's, you know, going to revolutionize something that, but you start to see these type A personalities, either the big brains, the big brawn, they're doing incredible things, but their lives are starting to show stress and even more, some fragments because you've been pushing them for so long. How do you quickly identify that and develop a situation to to preserve the organization so that you don't? I mean, some people are not going to come forward and say, "I'm having this problem at home." They're just going to keep that quiet. But how do you become a little invasive and you know engage and, and get that information out to identify that I need to step in and do something? How would you recommend somebody? Yeah, um, two things, communication and culture. I think if, if the culture within an organization doesn't allow an individual to, to come forward when he or she doesn't feel um, like they're operating at their max potential, that's probably not the best operating culture to be in. Right. And um, so one, it, you know, if, if you're a leader and you can make that cultural change, I would recommend doing that. Two, open lines of communications Vertical and laterally across the board. Um, if you're a subordinate leader or in charge of just a handful of folks, it's, it'll be much easier for you to to kind of keep the lines of communications flowing um, with your individuals. And and as the leader, you've got to do that. You've got to talk to your people, not just to find out what they did last night, where they had dinner, and and all that madness, but to kind of get a sense of their of where they're at mentally and. Uh, you have to, to do that to get a sense of where they're at, of their mental states. Yes. That, that changes continually. Everybody comes in uh, the room one minute, the next minute they're having issues. Yes. And um, you have to communicate in order to learn where they're at mentally. And the only way they'll do that is if they're comfortable with you. So yes. culture and communication solve that problem. Yes. Now, Rob, you mentioned when you took your selection for the special missions unit. You'd served in the Rangers. But this was pre, we call it antebellum, before 
9-11 started and kicked off and we were going to war. So a lot of men, including yourself, had not been, you know, in combat operations. Um, and I want to talk about, you know, now the unit that uh, you served in as special missions, they're teaching, you know, what a lot of other units are teaching, you know, how to, how to kill. They're just teaching at a different language, a little bit different level. Um, or I shouldn't say a little bit, a whole different level, but you're actually analyzing things. And, you know, the units that I served in, they get into the, the psychology and they actually have a lot of doctors and researchers who have discovered uh, what our bodies and minds go through hormonally, uh, what's going on in our brain and how those hormones and chemicals affect our manual dexterity, our visual acuity, what's going on when we're under stress uh, and we have to do something that is is going to go against everything in our entire life that we've been socialized not to do, which is kill another human being. And, uh, you know, everybody's talked about, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And a lot of people do freeze. I've, I've seen it happen. Uh, they hesitate. And that that is uh, that gives the enemy advantages and it, and it can lead to our deaths if you don't immediately have somebody that's trained to do that. But my my question is, is when you're training someone to do something that has been ingrained in them for decades since they're a youth and they can start to understand, you know, lessons from an adult, you're teaching them to do something complete opposite, complete contrary to that. How difficult is it? And then actually, how do you go about breaking down those things that are trained not just by their parents, educators, but everybody who's an authority in society and you're in a short order of time, you know, basically telling them disregard and now you got to do this. These other leaders are trying to think about innovation and this type of culture and they're trying to get people to change their thought processes. So how did you go about that in, in your job as not just a, I mean, your role as a leader and an instructor? Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I had a unique experience within the special missions unit. And what I mean by that, I'm, I talk as a whole because they do a, an absolutely incredible job selecting the individual coming to the, to the organization. And I think uh, where most organizations struggle to make certain individuals realize, hey, in order to save your life and this other individual's life next to you, you have to eliminate this person which is contrary to, I don't tell my kids it's okay to kill. Sure. So we grow up saying that's wrong. Right. And now you're trying to tell them, no, in this particular case, it's right. You can, it's, yes. you have to do it. Where when I was in the special, in the special missions unit, everybody that was to my left and right above and below me had already realized and understood we have to do this. Yes. So I, I can't give a, a uh, an honest um, answer with regards to how did I train or or help people overcome that I never had to. So as an outsider myself looking into your unit, you had a, a complete culture that understood that. And it's sort of like a religious experience where they're accepting people and oftentimes small numbers to come in and basically be a believer, to believe what everybody else is doing. And part of the opportunity to join the organization is that you kind of have a nail the altar for a Holy ghost moment that you accept and understand. And like, and that's a criteria of in that special missions, you know, of employment. You, Absolutely right. You have to think this way that there cannot be the hesitation. I mean, in, um, but it is, it is extraordinary, and I would say, you know, my personal recommendation to, you know, organizations that want to do something great, that are looking for unique individuals, that it it does have to be something that is completely, you know, infused across the entire organization, that understanding that this is what we're going to do. And some people that cannot accept that, you know, they have to go of, unless you want a mediocre organization, and then anybody that comes in, has to, just like Rob explained, has to accept that 
that is the way they do business. Obviously, uh, you know, those leaders of the organization have to have those strong morals and ethics or it can go, I mean, that kind of culture is, you know, I've said many times before, you know, the Marine Corps is, you know, cultish, you know, they, you know, believe similar to it's, it's a religion. You know, we've had commandants of the Marine Corps say, you know, we wear a cloth, like it's, it's like a religious experience. And it's very easy, you know, for some people to take that, you know, if it's not directly on true north and you can go very wrong very quickly. And Rob, one of the questions that uh, you mentioned in, you know, Warrior's Path uh, a few times is on contingency plans is, you know, how a leader can function in a, you know, very nebulous environment that not a lot is known is you already have, you know, a baseline standard operating procedures, but then, you know, as you get the specific situation that comes down, you start to, you know, quickly plan for what the contingencies could be and how important are those for leaders. You know, you have a SOP, a standard operating procedure like you've, you know, I've mentioned. That's established. A lot of time and effort went into that, but now you're getting into the special situation. You've got something that comes down and you can't just completely fixate on what that mission is because there's other external factors. There's enemy or in the corporate world, there's either a customer or a competitor and you have to think, and there's legal implications that can get people into a whole host of trouble. You have to think about those as contingencies. Uh, so you, because it eliminates blind spots. How did you do that in your organization to quickly plan and develop sound contingency plans? And how important were those? A super important contingency planning, uh, um, can make or break an operation. So, but you can also get so far into the weeds with your contingency planning that it takes you off track of your main plan. And the next thing you know, your, your primary plan is a contingency plan, and that's not what you want to do. The, the idea with contingency planning is, is, is like this. Think of things that commonly go wrong. If, if you've done this particular thing a few times and 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 each one of those instances this exact same thing happened that went wrong fix it so that's common occurring problems that's one way one aspect to view contingency plans most probable if you're in a situation and you can anticipate more than likely this is going to be the enemy has a vote yes and more than likely this is what they're going to do then you plan for that contingency. So we have common occurring and most probable. And then think um, worst case, most dangerous for those in the military, for the corporate world, think worst case scenario, what, what can happen so that you're not caught blindsided by something that you didn't think could ever happen. So, And those are all going to be different based on the situation and, and, and what you're actually doing. So... Take a look at your people, how you're applying those people to the problem, the environment that you're in, the leaders that you have above and below you, apply those common occurring, most probable, most dangerous slash worst case scenario to help drive your contingency planning. You got to have a process. You, you can't go through contingency planning, think of, of, oh, this and that, and then the good idea fairy comes in and gives you another good idea of what you should think about. You can't do that. You have to have a process or you're going to spend the bulk of your time just going in circles with regards to contingencies. Yes. Now, you served an entire career. You retired as a senior enlisted rank as a sergeant major. You have a lot of experience in dealing with uh, leading people. And it's also in the military, we don't like to talk about managing, but you know, sometimes manages to shape things in it which differs from leader, and that's not what we'll get into here. But my my question is, is through those years, no matter what organization, now how perfect the selection process could be, you're going to have a percent. In a, even in a special missions unit, it may not be like how they say in the regular army or you know an elite unit like the Rangers, you may have a 10%, but it's, there is a percent. And it may be a, a fraction of a percent, but it's there are people in there and then like the corporate world, you, you could be in a law firm or medical practice. 
you know, we've all read about congressmen. I mean, the approval rating, like in the trustworthy rating of some of these highly respected professions, you know, sometimes it gets low. Uh, but people being human beings, we can do the wrong thing. And when you as a leader see, you know, whether it's a soldier or an associate, they've shown some things that, uh, you know, they they were starting a trend. They've repeatedly disobeyed or disregarded safety or organizational rules, and you've counseled them it's not getting through. Where do you, and how would you consult someone, recommend, like, you have to develop these, like, trigger lines, these, you know, we don't, we don't pull our parachute below this altitude. You know, you have to do this for the good of the organization. He could be a, a close, you know, peer of yours, but what do you see as far as, you know, where where decision has to be made? How would you consult someone on that? Yeah, I think um, um, there's certain, certain aspects you need to take a look at, legal, morally, and ethical. If that individual violates any one of those things, they, they're absolute. Yes. They've got to go. The outside of that, you've got to take a look at the situation and, and and try to do the right thing for the individual and the organization. So think about that before you act um act out. So leaders it, it's it's dealing with people and thinking. Yes. And that's what that's all leadership is. Dealing with people and yes. trying to solve problems. And making decisions, so um, I, I would recommend um, trying to help the individual as much as as you can. And then there's got to be a threshold, right? Yes. At some point, we've got to let this individual go, and that's going to be based on the organization that you're in, specifically what you're doing. How far is too far is going to be based on, you know, aspects within the organization that I can't even begin to yes to mention. So yes, another thing in your book is an important key uh, that he writes about in a warrior's path is over your career. You know, we didn't think of this, although we incorporate it sometimes in training. But it, what I'm about ready to talk about is a little bit different. You know, in training you, before the war, you know, okay, this guy gets shot. You know, that's a, that's a tactic. You got to drag him out, um, but. As time went on, I know in our unit, um, we continued to go back and forth to the war, you know, six out of every 12 months out of the year. And, you know, my point is, looking back across your career, Rob, uh, you've experienced loss of personnel from death and injury and, you know, just people saying it's my time to uh, retire or they finish their service. Um, You know, a lot of the listeners are, managers and leaders in organizations that don't necessarily anticipate, you know, those key leaders, you know, voluntarily walking. And you had mentioned in your book um, on, you know, you basically accepted this promotion, a senior leadership role. And then all of a sudden, shortly thereafter, you're in the senior leadership role, although you're deployed, but uh, one of the soldiers is taken out of the fight, you know, in direct combat operations, and you got thrust back into that operational role. Uh, so how would you consult, you know, a business leader or a military leader to, you know, do one of the things I know I had done is when we kept going back and forth, I, I told my boss, the commanding officer, when I was a force recon platoon commander that, sir, we need to identify by name our reserves, not like reservists from, you know, this category of personnel over here, but like the immediate, who's going to fill that job tonight? If we have casualties tonight, who is going to do it? And how would you specifically advise somebody to uh, be able to function with a plan to identify the loss of not just equipment or something bad happens, but a human being, you know, walks off the job or quits. That's a key person. How how do you advise on that? Yeah, I think... um on the, in the corporate world and outside of the military, you, you got to think in depth. And what I mean by that, position in depth. So if you have a single individual who is who has the golden nugget of information and only this particular individual um, can do a certain thing, that that's not the right way to to produce your 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 business. 
You've got to have a series of people in depth that share that responsibility, that share that information. So if one individual yes. leaves, it's not a huge, the train doesn't stop. In the military, the train never stops. Yes. So regardless of, of whether or not you plan to backfill that said individual, it's going to happen. Yes. But what's important as a leader in the military is to identify that early, you know, to have a seamless approach yes. to the problem and it'll be more efficient and effective, especially if that set individual is, is tapped to said, hey, here's kind of how it's laid out. Yes. If John gets hurt, uh, Fred, you're going to go replace him. Now I have, I can anticipate responsibilities. Yes. And I can come up with a, an initial plan if I have to do it. So you have to lean forward in the saddle at that point. On the corporate world, just think in depth. So that single individual leaves, it's not a detriment. Or the, the plane doesn't crash into the hillside because you lost your, your only individual who had the information. Yes. I know we would often do, you know, okay, like I mentioned before, you know, down you're, you're down, you're, you're wounded. But we wouldn't necessarily think of those, you know, put deeper thought into those continuing actions. Like this person was our medical expert or he had all of this type of, you know, deep knowledge and in, in how you have to, you know, take it to the left of that and make sure that those replacements have that level of knowledge and skill to function at that level. And, you know, I'm speaking, there's certain leaders in business right now that are listening to this and are thinking that this does not apply to me. And I'm telling you right now, it does. And in your organization, you know, do not have that blind spot where you think this person is so good because when they leave, you know, you're, you're going to open yourself to, to, you know, some serious vulnerabilities. Next thing I want to talk about, Rob, is in an innovation. And innovation is essential for the growth of any particular company. However, there's, there's, there's some problems with that. A lot of people, if they're in organizations that have the resource to go out and look at different options, you know, whether it's um, one thing or the next, you know, people can look at them as like, hey, this guy's getting preferential treatment because, you know, he's got some, he or she knows somebody over here that's kind of helping him out. And it kind of is like a brown nose aspect. But how would you recommend to foster that innovation in a healthy way inside an organization? Yeah, I did. Again, I've said it probably three or four times already, but it starts at the organization's culture. Um, if if that particular individual feels like he or she can't do something because they don't have the permission um, to do it, then that's probably not the right culture to to expect someone to to come forward with new ideas or or, or to give a new perspective on on a on a a program or, or whatnot. So that that's critical is the culture within the organization. And then two, if, if you want to create that type of culture, um, you can do it in, in, in a, just a, a, a military organization or a civilian organization. You can do it. it won't be easy. On the civilian side, you've got to start slow, start with particular individuals, get buy-in from your, sub -out, your, your uh, subordinate leaders, Get them on board initially, um, start slow, give them left and right limits, and then that will grow. It won't be overnight, and it's not going to be easy, but you can do it. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Now, mission that uh, the unit that you were with um, had a great responsibility, uh, much more so than a regular military unit, which sometimes are doing what we call realistic urban training. I mean, you're actually operating with real weapons off base and doing things that, you know, if, if a leader decided to make a decision that was immoral or unethical, it is possible that that could happen. Um, and there's been a number, especially in the civilian world, even also in the military, uh, where those leaders, you know, whether it's the Enrons uh, or many corporations, you name it, um, you know, where, Financial reports get altered, but what do you counsel, you know, organizational leaders that, you know, when it's somebody, possibly even themselves, that's being asked or told to do something that's immoral or unethical, and it's even in the lightest. I mean, how do you advise somebody? And, and I know in my 
my personal example, I knew, and I have had to in the past, you know, when I knew something was wrong, I had to live my mind just like in, in any other combat operation, like that I knew I could die that night. I had to accept that, that, uh, you know, you, you would, you know, walk away and it could be very detrimental to your career. But how would you advise someone in the corporate world who is being under, you know, they have that understanding that they're being pressured or coerced to do something that is immoral or unethical. What type of, you know, guidance would you give them, you know, to as an individual or as an organization to make sure that those things don't destroy that individual who looks back with re- regret or the organization, which that could start leading. I mean, there's a re- reason why we have these rules and it could lead to the fatality of an, of a business. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it, it uh, I'll take back to uh, the contingency plan. So you got to think about some of these scenarios when you come into, into a, um, into a position, especially if you understand that you have a leader that that is questionable, and um, so one think about it initially and determine, you know, at some point you have to make a decision on on what you're going to do. One is if your leader is asking you to mortgage your integrity, that would be a red flag. So determine your flags, and and, and those will be your decision points on your next step. So. War game it a little bit. Don't worst case it. Just you know mentally talk yourself through some different types of situations, and we can talk about a lot of them, right? And you just read the yes. news, and and everything's. You know, there's always something. Somebody's doing something immorally yes. or or or, le- or illegal. Yes. And and that's the reality of 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 working for you know, for people because yes. not all people are good. Yes. So take a look at at the potential problems, and and I would say if someone starts to ask you to mortgage your integrity or to do something that that may be legal but isn't right, yes, then you need to think about that that question. You know, one of the things I know we did in the military is we did a lot of tactical training. You know, this person gets shot. You know, the person's got to step up, and you're told to not just you know play that out, but to actual visualize, even when you're not in that training role, you know, you're going home and you're thinking like, am I prepared? If I die, do I need to get my, literally, you need to get your home in order, you know, the will, the, all those continuing actions. And I found that units that do not do that, you know, when a lot of these units that are, everybody thinks the military is everybody's trained to go into combat. And to a, a point, I would say that's correct, but it's how much training they get is is my other point here that some units they're out on a convoy and they're not you know they these are the tenth typewriter or the PowerPoint platoons or software sections I mean they're not expecting it and they haven't trained that and they get contact and people get injured and they go into shock and and my point is is some people when they don't mentally rehearse they don't follow through with actions and training that this could happen and I know. You know, one of the things in the Army Green Braves, not from personal experience, but they, in the Robin Sage, they they induce these moral scenarios where someone from a foreign country who they're training is going out and saying, hey, this is just our culture. This is how we're committing these atrocities. They're trying to instill in those special forces leaders, you know, that, you know, now it's not just a tactical action. It's a, it's a moral decision that, you know, you have to understand these trigger lines are being crossed and you have to immediately step in. So, uh, you know, my personal perspective is, you know, some of these soft skills, not just the special skills in, in killing or in innovating in somebody's business, but you have to practice those moral and ethical principles, you know, and create some dilemmas as leaders. We have to plan that. Absolutely agree. Absolutely. Now, Rob, the next question is when a leader... Oftentimes, you know, they assume like like you did in ranger school, you know, people were relying on you because of your proficiency in navigation, those skills, and but you're starting to understand you are depleting, you know, your mental faculties, your energy resources, and you're not making uh, the best decisions. And sometimes leaders uh, will always try to, you know, hit the overdrive button, and it's a detriment whether it's a machine or a man or a woman. 
Um, you know, and that could, you know, a practical example is somebody that, you know, has a child or a wife that's got some terminal illness, cancer or something, but they, they try to continue on. And how would you advise, you know, somebody who's a key leader in an organization, you know, and it's because a lot of people, they really struggle with this. You know, when is it important for that, you know, person to, you know, step aside uh, and take a, a necessary break for the good of the organization? That's a, that's a great, great question and, a, and an aspect that affects every organization, whether it be military or, or not. Um, that's an individual call. And um, again, I think the, the organization should have rules or policies in place where an individual can come forward and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm to a point here to where I've got things going on that, that is affecting my, my output at work. And those policies in place should be able to have, um, should be in place so that they support the individual and they're, they're not going to ostracize that individual for coming forward and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm in a bad way here and I need help. I need a little break. Can you help me? And that's all it is, is a cry for help. Uh, I've seen some military organizations where they take that particular uh, individual and immediately ridicule him or her, and that is not the right way to go. Um, so there's some gray area, too. There's some people who just will use that as an avenue to kind of get out of work, but then there's those individuals who are going to come forward who and who are um, genuinely hurting. Yes. So I would say take a look at each case individually, ensure that your policies um, in place will support that individual coming forward, and hopefully you have the culture where uh, that individual can come forward and, and not be uh, not feel like he or she's going to be persecuted for for understanding that he or she is is, is not uh, working to their full potential. Yes, and Rob, one of the other questions I know we talked about it tonight right after dinner was in the area of communication, and you worked in a unit where that had been. So streamlined, it, you know, epitomized the maximum of efficiency. I mean, these were well developed, and these concise brevity codes, as we call them in the military, uh, they had specific meanings, and that's all in that organization that needed to be said something very concise that was developed and created to to have a meaning. And I know in certain businesses and cultures, you know, some people want to over communicate, but sometimes that causes, you know, as silly as this sounds, this is a first world problem here. Uh, but, you know, some people send too much emails back or they include everybody in it and it makes everybody, it, yes, everybody gets the chance to read it, but that kind of can slow the whole organization down. That when you come back to work and you were absent for a day or you had to go travel and you're gone for two days and you got 200 emails uh, that, you know, there's no understand, you know, but communication, clear which I'm not doing right now, uh, <laughs> clear and concise the importance of it. How would you consult an organization from your past experiences and how you effectively utilized clear, concise communication and how organizations need to incorporate into that into their culture? Yeah, as we know, there's many different ways to communicate in this day and age. The cell phone, and most people don't use their phone anymore to communicate through the phone. They don't they're, talk. they're emailing and they're texting and they're... And they're chatting or whatever, and, and and sometimes the simplest form is to just talk, speak with someone directly. That's right. And uh, we tend to forget that this and, and with all right. the new technology these days. And I'm telling you, the key to effective or face mail or get in front of the person. That's right. Can. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them will text the person in the next room. That's right. Yeah. So um, the the key to effective leadership is is communication. And whenever you, ha you have the opportunity to streamline your communication and, and to minimize essentially the amount of communication so that, one, you're getting the proper information that you need, and two, it's in a timely manner, that's what you should be looking at. Yes. And, and that's a trained thing. So tell your people, say, here's what I want. In the next meeting, this is the key bits of information that I need, and here's the format that I want it in. And yes. when I get updates between now and then, here's what I'm looking for. So... 
if you just give a broad spectrum, give me an update tomorrow, you yes. know, you, then that's not micromanaging. If yes. you ask them for certain types of information and, and yes. you know, how to, and now you're helping them. They're expecting it to be put uh, packaged a certain way, and then it, it'll be more streamlined for you. So. And those leaders need to develop those rules because I've seen in a lot of business organizations and in the military too, where certain days you can't even get in touch with people because they're tied up in meetings all day. And they have to come back and they have to answer all these emails, but it's because, you know, there's redundant, you know, and that's to, that is not even the proper word that, you know, we beat a dead horse and people go into meetings, you know, to, you know, belabor a point and go on and on. So like what Rob had mentioned, it is very important. I've seen that in organizations to, you know, train your people on what that standard is, you know, what certain items mean, how you want to be communicated, how often you want to be updated. There's a, there's things we used in our unit in combat, you know, just utilizing your call sign, you know, or a last name was acknowledgement that you received and understood what was just, you know, put out there. But it was, again, it's, it was either one number or a name and people already not understood that means you acknowledge it. And we've, but we put deliberate effort into that and practicing it. And a lot of, <laughs> Business coaches do not talk about the importance of, you know, streamlining your communication. And when you're in an operation where you have multiple aviation platforms to come in and conduct electronic warfare on an objective area, to conduct a strike and to bring casualty evacuations or extract aircraft, and everybody's, you have to practice on being, you know, very concise and very clear, you know, for that communication. Now, you may not have all that many people talking at once, but I've seen a lot of organizations reduce their effectiveness and productivity and their bottom line with their net profits because they cannot communicate what they want to, you know, send and receive effectively. You know, Rob, in an organization that, um, you know, not just the military, but, you know, they have a clear and defined boss, a lot of these people these days, they want to go work and wear the purple shirts and they're confused at who's the boss. But uh, in those organizations that tend to be much more vertical, uh, you know, there's established, you know, line and block diagrams. You know, some of those times there can be a tendency, not in every organization, but to micromanage. Um, and some people don't um, function well in that type of leadership style. And some of that's just grumbling and you just have to continue on. That's just how it's going to be. But sometimes it does become an impediment to not just one or two individuals, but organizationally. How do those, you know, subordinates, the rank and file provide that bottom up feedback effectively? You know, that a boss, this is, this is starting to have some degradation on our performance because you're asking for too much information. I just don't know what it's doing or we see this information is, and we're, we're spending a lot of time producing all these TRP reports and those <laughs> right. things are just going in the round file. I mean, uh, but bottom line, people are micromanaged. How does the rank and file provide tactfully that bottom up refinement that, uh, you know, this micromanagement is I'm about ready to walk and, you know, this is going to lead to some, you know, issues in the organization. Yeah. And, um, what a, what a great aspect because to talk about, because micromanagement is the, the number one killer of great ideas, it will absolutely destroy a wonderful and, and, and great um, organization. Uh, micromanagement is, is nothing more than a killer. So how do we manage that? Unfortunately, based on my personal experience, um, more often than not, micromanagement is a byproduct of someone's insecure personality. And... Um, if it's not, then you have an easy day because then you can approach that individual with a plan to move forward and to help reduce the micromanagement. If the micromanagement is a byproduct of an individual's personality or insecurity, that's the difficult thing because now you're attacking that individual. So you have to be smart. 
do your homework. List circumstances where micromanagement hindered your performance, whether it's you as an individual or a group of individuals, and keep a running list so that now when you bring the information forward, you're just not talking to the individual. It's very hard for people to argue facts. Here's the facts. We have it written down. Here's the, what you asked us to do. You micromanaged us, and this is, was the outcome. Had we had looked at it this way and you asked us to do it this other way, this could have been the outcome. So do your homework. Um, approach based on the personality of your leader. If, if you know this particular individual is, um, will more than likely dig his or her heels in, you're going to have to do a lot of homework. What I mean by that is you have to have a plan. So determine the best approach based on the individual is, is my recommendation. Yes. There's no other way around it. But you got you to do it. You have to do it or, or leave. I mean, there's no other option. Yes. Now, in your book, you mentioned that you, right after September 11, 2001 had occurred, you and some of your unit members went up and were conducting some training in New York City, and you went to Ground Zero. And how important is that? You know, this day and age, everybody wants to talk about customer, uh, getting a true sense of how that customer feels. And and I don't want to, you know, look at it, but we did receive, you know, sort of like in the business term, I guess we would have been a competitor, but they provided much in the way of a customer would. But how important is it in the business world as you train a lot of the clients that you have is to understand the service that you're providing, you know, from that customer perspective, to, like we talk about in the military, to turn the map around and see it from how they see it and experience like what you are providing. And I know you went to ground zero to see like, you get a sense of a a, a true firsthand taste of what it's like to be there uh, and to understand like, and to let that sink in. How would you advise, you know, those business leaders to, to get that, you know, ground level taste of, you know, what they are providing in the services and how to make it the highest quality? Yeah, just to add a little bit on that, because that's a pretty significant um, um, event for me, because we, we went to, to Ground Zero in November, and so the concrete was still wet, and you could smell it in the air. The lights were on, and vehicles were moving. They were still moving um, debris out of there. We actually got to speak with some of the uh, first responders that were on scene, and the just to hear the stories and, and, and that's just something I will never forget. And, um, and it's hard to put that into perspective or to, or to share that feeling verbally without having ex- experienced it yourself. Um, so whenever my advice to anybody out there who wants to, you know, kind of bring that, type of learning event to to your organization is you've got to get down to the into the wet concrete if you will if you're um if you're having if you have a business and you want to take your individuals out and and show them and give them an experience to send the message they're they're, they will never ever forget that and um and I don't know if that was on purpose by our leaders to take us down there to um, September 11th or not, but but it definitely rang home, and it still does to this day. I, I can still smell the concrete right now as I'm speaking, talking to the individuals on the ground. But um, if you can do that, and I, I can't advise you on 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 how to do it because I don't know everybody's um, organization and, and and what they're doing, but. If you can tie in some of that suffering and, and make your people understand that you're doing this for a reason and you can share that amongst each other, that's what creates that bond and will help you, you know, take your organization to another level. 
Yes. Yeah. And you didn't have a lot of time after you left there in November 2001. Very shortly after that, in 2001, you were in Afghanistan. Right. On almost no warning. You know, here you traveled with, you know, two other guys, as you mentioned in your book. I mean, you know, that the importance of being able to live your life and understanding, like, what my role is that at any time, and a lot of times people think that, well, that's a military thing. That's a first responder thing. I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not a firefighter. I don't have to visualize and envision these kinds of things happening, but as a business owner or a leader, not a entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur, you know, you're, you're inside, you know, fortune 100 company, you're inside a small business. You know, it is, it is critical that, that you see, you know, what could go on, you know, to expect the unexpected. And Rob, what would you say as far as, you know, the individuals in any size of a business, you know, being able to live their life, you know, and on a second's notice, be able to, hey, hey, honey, I got to, you know, travel and this and that. And, you know, to, you know, to provide that, you know, you know, to see the unseen, you know, but you kind of know that some of these things could happen. It may be unlikely, but, you know, provide that balance at home so things don't you know, have these huge, you know, heavy roles at sea because, you know, you didn't properly prepare yourself and your family for what your job truly could entail. What kind of advice would you give to some of those uh, young business leaders to uh, plan in advance on how to how to set the stage, you know, for themselves and their family to to live their life? Yeah, I think if you incorporate, um, you know, simply like an annual or or a biannual event where you bring um, individuals to a to a point to where that you make them realize the realities or the worst uh, possible outcome of their profession. And and there's many different ways that you can do this. You can plan ahead and do that. And without doing that, your people won't realize, you know, the worst case possibilities of their, of their profession. And is it far fetched? Uh, Absolutely. But if you were to ask me in August of 2001 if three airplanes would have attacked the United States and brought down the World Trade Center, I would have thought you were insane. Right. So, you know, like you said, you know, trying to expect the unexpected, we don't want to get too crazy and, and become preppers. But then again, we need to remind ourselves every now and again and the realities of our chosen profession, whether you're a business owner and you make clothes for people, you know, let's get out there and see what, what let's go out and see what our clothes are doing. How are, do the people like them? Or get them out there and, and have them experience that, talk to people. And that's just one aspect of, you know, trying to get down into the knee, into the weeds, if you will. Yes. And... Rob, you mentioned in your book, you know, A Warrior's Path, that, you know, when you went into Afghanistan, you were there er, very early, one of the very first individuals on that um, deployment into combat. And there you were, you, you went into Afghanistan, you're trying to collect some information over in Pakistan, and you found you couldn't get back. And, you know, the information was, created something in your mind that just didn't sound right. You know, and you as a leader, you were the leader of, you know, just a less than one handful of guys, but you learn an important lesson in there. And if you could expound on that is how you had to you know, take the bull by the horns and that you could not be indecisive. And you just started, and that was kind of like a, a revelation to you that like, hey, I'm kind of trained to, you know, wait in line and listen to this guy who's telling me when the next flight back into Afghanistan is so I can go in there and do what I'm sent to be doing because your unit training to just do the right thing. But you're kind of getting the standard canned answer in the runaround from this fella it is a military guy. And, you know, we're trained to sort of think that, you know, just accept that. But you as a leader, you know, you could not and, and you shouldn't just, you know, think that, you know, okay, that's the only answer. How, if you could elaborate, how's a leader 
did that change your thinking then? And do you recommend people think outside the box? Yeah, I think um, that is probably not 100% due to my military background. But just like you said, more, most often than not, you know, we are going to do things and, and accept things that, that we don't really like. So it came to a point in this particular instance where I was trying to get my people out of Pakistan and back into Afghanistan. It had been three days of going to the airfield and say, hey, is there an aircraft going to Afghanistan? And I got the canned answer, no. And you kept seeing a lot of planes coming in. Airplanes coming in and out. When I asked this particular individual, there was an airplane sitting on the runway and he said, there's nothing going into Afghanistan. And um, so I think people... In the military, we we are are conditioned to accept what is told to us, whether it's good or bad. Yes. So I had to learn to get over that. Yes. And so it got to a point to I realized I cannot accept that anymore. I know one of these aircraft is going to Afghanistan. So I ended up, um, I told my guys, grab your packs. We're going to the airfield. I grabbed the first individuals at night, so we had our night vision on. I grabbed them, and I said, hey, any of these? There's three C-130s sitting on the tarmac. I had just left the officer in charge and asked him if any of those aircraft were going to Afghanistan, and he said no. I asked the 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 um, well, the aircraft— uh, The flight crew. Part, the flight crew individual and said, hey, any of these guys going to— um, Afghanistan, he jumped on the radio and said, number two, they'll pull up and pick you up. All we need is your names and numbers. And I said, let's go. And um, but, but the whole point for me sharing that experience was I realized that you have to push forward to do the right thing. The, the, and that was unique in that essentially, and I, will, I to this day do not know why that person was lying to me. I don't know if he didn't like me. I don't know if he was told to not let anyone fly into Afghanistan. I I will never know. But the bottom line was, is I needed to get my people out of there. So I made a decision to to get us out of there. And that really changed my philosophy at an early time in the war. To be decisive. To be decisive. Yes. And to be committed once I make a decision. And and I realized I can get in trouble, but I'm still doing it. And that and that really changed a lot in, in me personally, and um, and professionally because I realized that um, leaders can't and should not accept the status quo. Yes, we continually have to challenge if we know what we want and what we want to do is correct. Yes, and the right thing. You also mentioned in your book, how both in Afghanistan in the early phases, as well as later on, you describe in detail a particular deployment when you're in Iraq, how some of these missions, you know, you have a plan going in, this is what we're going to do, and you have contingency plans for that. But then we all know Murphy's Law, and, you know, the enemy has a vote, things don't go right. And even things that we have as a contingency plan, we didn't plan for them to go this bad. But you as a leader, especially, you know, you were in Afghanistan and not everything was functioning perfectly. And in Iraq, definitely, as you describe in this one chapter that, uh, I mean, you got a lot of guys, you know, one, one of your soldiers was killed. Several others were wounded and severely wounded. Um, and, it it must have been very painful to see, you know, like George Washington, real key leaders in America. They didn't sometimes they couldn't even face their men because they loved them so much. They had emotion for them, and and you experienced that in these units as well. But some very difficult things happened that you had to watch. And you know, the military sometimes we call that the fog of war, or Murphy's Law, and it, it's just like this big nebulous phrase. And here, you know. You're one of the first few guests that I've been able to talk to on the show who can explain from a firsthand perspective as a leader how you how you cope 
with trying to drive on and accomplish that mission, how you focus. I mean, you, you're there, you're physically exhausted, you're mentally drained. And how would you coach someone to allow them to, you know, forecast and understand that this is likely, you know, in your profession over the long term, this is going to happen and how you prepare yourself for that. Yeah, that's got it. That has to happen at the individual level. You have to come to a uh, understanding with yourself that this can happen. And when it does happen, I have to have the fortitude and the personal resolve to see it through the end. Whether, whether I come out unscathed, injured, injured or, or dead. And as long as I am leading or following with character, I'm not violating or mortgaging my integrity, I am executing my my mission with uh, morals and values that are based on my character, then we continue to push forward. And um, there comes a point in time to where, you know, you may question, do I continue to move forward? And, and there's been multiple, unfortunately, multiple times where I've had to deal with injured um, friends and or injured um, uh, subordinates and 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 not once that I ever on the battlefield or after question my resolve because right. I had thought about it prior to that event happening and um, but you did mention in your book it caused you to innovate. And you listen to some other folks from some other units that said, hey, if we, we hit this criteria, you know, we're just going to back off and, and drop this house and, and destroy it. And that, it was, that was a period where it was kind of like another revelation, an aha moment, as people call it, that you know, it, it taught you to think about, you know, hey, we're trained in this unit to be assaulters. This is our profession. This is what we're the most highly skilled at doing, than, more so than any unit in America. And, you know, I'm sure that can, for a sense, think of like, well, those guys, you know, they just, you know, they're slacking or they're not doing what, you know, we should be doing. But you have to, as a leader, adapt with the environment. You know, if there's, there is a better way to do it and you can accomplish the same purpose and be more efficient and, and save your own lives and other resources uh, it's important to think about those things, not challenging your resolve, uh, because sometimes in that tactical fight, you you do have to, you know, you know you're committed. I mean, you're engaging the enemy, and you you can't back down at that point. But you know, a leader has to, you know, during those refit cycles, you know, understand from other people's after action reviews and their lessons learned that you know this these are different tools that we we can also it's not not normal for us and it was was that difficult to understand sometimes when yeah absolutely and i think um in in this particular case uh, in in 2005 we had been in 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 conflict now since 2001 whether it was in afghanistan and iraq and then now in 2005 we're operating in iraq and so we think about that we've been in conflict for you know, close to five years now. Yes. But we hadn't seen or, or, or had, as an organization, been in, in a situation where we slugged it out with the enemy and we won, but it was at a very, very high cost. Yes. And that happened to me and my, and my guys. So... And that hurts you. And that hurts so as as the leader on the ground i realized we had to we had to change a little bit yes we i had to become a a a smarter leader for my guys and just to add perspective a little bit within the organization there's no shortage of bravado yes. and everybody there is 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 a brave whether it's physically brave or morally brave, that they're they're just unique individuals. And now I'm asking them to do things that are different. 
because we've had almost five years of 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 uh, conflict under our belt, continuous. Yes. But we hadn't experienced an event like this yet. Yes. So for those of us on the ground who we tried to change what we had been doing normally um, for the past five years, and even before that, we realized this was the right thing to do and it was smart. Now, not everybody was had bought into what I was doing, but I shoved it down their throats yes. as the leader because I knew it was the right thing to do. Yes. We had to change. But from in its simplest form, I couldn't continue the status quo because if I would go do another operation that next night and the same thing happened, I'd be combat ineffective because I wouldn't have enough people to yes. to run operations. So we had to change. And it wasn't easy. And and um it wasn't that pill of change wasn't swallowed by everybody immediately, but eventually it, it yes. came. It came around, and that was one of the the most uh, trying times in my entire yes. career. And you mentioned in your book how you're a part of a very small organization that people are inside your organization are looking. And you mentioned this one officer, you know, who's coming in to, you know, from your same unit, you know, to replace, you know, is that standard rotational time, and there had been that you know, personnel loss, you know, through injury, death, uh, you know, and he's, you know, saying some words, giving you kind of a foreshadow of how the unit may be perceiving this back in the United States, as well as, you know, how that unit, you know, directly that officer's coming in and his men may feel about you. But you, you know, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, blow his ego up here, but you still continued on, you know, with giving them, you know, a a turnover that was as best you possibly could, and letting them know that for for your best ability to accomplish the mission and survival of your men, the baseline with the enemy has changed, and and you must continue to adapt and innovate. And here's what we learned, and hopefully they they take it on board. But they didn't have to. But in your book, you said they did, and they were successful, and they so. You know, it wasn't, you know, just what you learned, but it, it did allow others to capitalize. And, you know, ideally, you know, they didn't have to experience that bitter pill that, that you were forced to, you know, experience firsthand with the loss. Um, very, very important uh, thing that, you know, you pass on those lessons to someone else. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the, the thing I want to share with, with, with the listeners out there is, is the, is change is not easy for anybody, but it's the leader's responsibility to make change happen if it's the right thing to do. It was crystal clear in my yes. mind that it was the right thing to do at that point in time. No, yes. no question. Yes. So. Now, speaking of change, you mentioned that, you know, two different changes in your, your career. One, a point in time in 2001, you... You went into Afghanistan, two other members with you. You were in charge. You were specially selected as, a hey, pick one other guy, and we're going to have a, another person added to you, and you're going to do a very a, a mission that was left a lot to the imagination, very broad. And you as a leader had to think of that way with a just very minimal resources in an extremely austere environment. It's the wintertime in Afghanistan. Um, and also, I want to, you know, make it very clear to listeners. This next point I'm going to talk about, you know, 2005, and he was even in 2006 deploying into Iraq. Totally different uh, situation where you know we're facing surge. You know, over a hundred thousand U.S. forces, not small and austere. And you know, the reason that you went in with only two other people is there was limitations. Not like you said in the book. You know, JSOC had some limitations, but that was also pushed down from in, in Tampa with the CENTCOM, the the commanding, the, or the commander. You know, the flag officer wears four stars. That's in charge of everything that's going on in the Middle East. There was severe personnel limitations in that time period due to the politics in 2001 of how many people we could put on the ground. So, but as a leader, 
you had to be able to adapt to your environment of working with, you know, only two other people with other resources that were minimal and in a mission that was completely, it was, it was very vague and it was left mainly to yourself to decide. In the opposite, you know, 2005, 2006, you'd had, you know, over five, half a decade of combat experiences. Now you're, um, you know, there's a ton of resources. The enemy has advanced. And you mentioned there was challenges of actually, you know, staying ahead of the enemy and how it was, you know, you're, it was difficult to find out where they were. How does a leader, you know, how important is it for a leader to be able to be both? And I also wanted the listeners before you answer, Rob, when I say, you know, his, his rank, when he was out there in combat, you know, this later stage, 2005, 2006, he's a, a Sergeant major, which is very different than the senior enlisted rank in the Marine Corps. Uh, they get paid the same, but in the Marine Corps, Sergeant major is, mainly uh, advising the unit commander, a sergeant major in your organization is actually fighting. He's making decisions, you know, you know, where at that point of friction, you know, belt buckle distance, you're facing the enemy. And you'd had a lot of these um, experiences, but, you know, five years into the fight, um, it was still difficult. How is it, how essential is it for a leader to be able to function effectively in both environments, austere, minimal guidance, hardly any manpower, and then to a, a very complex where there's a lot of enemy, a lot of conventional forces, also a lot of restrictions and rules right, and engagements yeah. tighten up. Uh, how do you transform yourself and be effective in both settings? Well, I think um, there's some, some commonalities to both, and, and I'll share those here. One is Understanding basic tactics, um, and and as an example, understanding maneuver. Maneuver is maneuver. Whether you're in an austere environment or in an urban area or in the middle of the desert or in the jungle, maneuver is maneuver. So there's some common things that 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 are shared in all the environments. Whether you're, I was in in Afghanistan and and in Iraq in an urban area. Things that were different were were the supporting mechanisms. In Iraq, we had a very robust um, support mechanism. We had um, we had hot chow. Yeah. <laughs> hot <laughs> showers. In Afghanistan, dude, we didn't have much of anything. I mean, yes. we lived out of my rucksack. Yes. For and um, so when you have a lot, um, that comes with a lot of baggage. So we had to streamline our processes to be able to react to information quickly because when you fast forward into the war from 2001 to 2005 the enemy's learned they've learned how you know they are learning how we operate they are learning and have learned our tactics they are learning how we're targeting them so they're getting smart so we have to change our targeting and then we have to streamline our reaction time so that we can get them because we can no longer plan for an operation that's going to take place um, two nights from now. We have to plan and react and be on the ground in 30 minutes. Yes. This is how quick we have to respond. Now Now we're responding um, very rapidly, but luckily for us, we have the support to, to make that happen. Um, where in 2001, um, there was we didn't have any of that backside support, if you will, so we were making decisions and and pushing forward based on actual information on the ground, and um, our only link back to our headquarters was a radio, and then I had a a, a small Panasonic Tup book where I could um, send some data back and forth yes. um, through the through the Satcom radio. But um, challenges in both. Terrain definitely unique in in each, and they both come with their unique t challenges as well. But you have to be able to operate in both, and and, and that's the bottom line as best as you can. Yes. And um, so as some of the listeners out there probably saying, so so what? So he you know he uh, was in Afghanistan, Iraq, and what that really must be taken on by the listeners is you. You may be in a, a small business, um, 
or you may be in a large business in in a role where you're a new manager and you're not thinking and anticipating ahead that it may not be five years down the road that you are in a position you could very soon be thrust into a role that you have far greater responsibility you know in developing strategy or managing a large number of personnel his his experiences did you know you know they continued on every year he was he was deploying you know but things had changed and you know the the key point is you do have to anticipate and visualize you know what that vision of the future is and how do you properly prepare and again you have to be staying 10 steps ahead so that that day could happen very quickly and what do you need to do to prepare yourself to effectively fight in that stage and speaking of that rob you spent a career in the military and then and we talked a little bit about tonight um you it came time to retire and that's that's a difficult decision not just to make but to execute and to live when you're working in such close proximity and the type of work which you do is very intense and meaningful and rewarding and satisfying and then you move on to um, other opportunities and fields of work that uh, don't provide that daily uh, gratification instant feedback rewards from you know close you know friends how difficult was that, and how did you manage that? It was very difficult. The first first year, probably the first couple of years after retirement, it was, um, I mean, the first six months, I, I would wake up and say, I, I, I want to go back. I, I, yes. I, I, <laughs> I would want to pick up the phone and, and call my former unit and say, will you take me back? Right. And um, but I had to remember and remind myself the reasons why I why I decided to retire, and that was for my family. And um, and and as you know, in every organization, there's we, when we leave, we only remember the good things, right? We only remember, oh, it was so great doing this. It was I got so much satisfaction out of this, but we don't remember the the times that we hated it, when we hated it there, or we didn't like, or didn't support, or whatever, and and. Uh, the, the my former unit is 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 not excluded from that you know there's things i did things there where i really didn't want to do or or, or what have you right so bottom line is i had to remind myself why i chose to leave and it was for my family so the first couple of years were super super difficult and then after that i i came to the realization that i needed to focus on and 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 change my my mission your purpose. My purpose, yeah. So when I was in, in in the military, specifically in the special missions unit, that was my professional self. Yes. That I I was Rob Chavino, special mission unit member. And that was taken away when I retired. So I had to find Rob Chavino's new professional self. Yes. So this is me, Rob Chavino, and I'm good with that. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And what would your advice be to the next generation that uh, you know receives the torch from uh, those who are serving and have served? They're they're thinking in their mind. They have that desire in their heart. Those listeners that you know, just like yourself as a young teenager, when you wanted to serve, what would your advice after a career in special operations be to them as far as how to how to prepare themselves for serving in the military? Yeah, I would say if if you're coming or you're having thoughts of joining the military, you, be honest with yourself and educate yourself and understand really what you're getting into. I think uh, the services across the board do a horrible job with actually educating individuals with the realities of of the military, and 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 my point with all this is you know we have a a, a post. Um, conflict issue with PTSD and and people committing suicide. If we can get ahead of that a little bit and kind of educate those individuals coming in prior to them signing, I think we can you know push off some of that some of those potential problems. Um, 
So my recommendation is to educate yourself and truly understand what you may be getting yourself into. If you're in right now and you've decided to make the military a career, serve with character, with honor, and lead with your people. The worst leader out there that you can be is a self-serving leader. And that's that's kind of weird to think about because when we get into a position, we only think about ourselves. And if I do good, I'll get promoted. And if I do well, I'll get more money, regardless if we're in the military or whatever. But if you think of it in terms of if I get in there and I help my organization succeed, you're helping yourself as a leader. You know, help your people help you become a the best leader possible. As soon as you put your people before yourself, before your professional self, you're going to set yourself on the track to be a great leader. If you make decisions to that that you only promote yourself, you're going to take that road down the left and eventually mortgage your integrity and then you're going down the wrong track. Yes. And thank you so much for your service to our country, Rob. Uh, And what I also like to mention is his service is not just a standard service. He, he truly did something exceptional for his country and he, he views himself as, as an American and we should all uh, have that same sense that we live in a, in a very incredible country. We've been blessed with, you know, what, you know, our ancestors could not even imagine and, um, you know, I really appreciate not just that service, but what you learned and what you're passing on through uh, your book, A Warrior's Path. And uh, again, leaders, those listening, we will put this on, on the website so that you can uh, go to our webpage and buy this uh, book. It's Rob Trevino, spelt again, T-R-I-V-I-N-O. Um, his call signs rat and uh <laughs> which are his initials um not a not a dirty derogatory term and uh also uh how those listeners c- can support the go commando show which we truly appreciate being as it allows us to bring out a, a guest like rob who's spending his time uh, to come out here and visit and we truly appreciate that uh but when you go on the website uh whether and I'm not saying, you know, we don't have any subscriptions. So to uh, make this beneficial for the Go Commando website, any of those sponsors, you know, many people buy products that are sold through Amazon. And if you uh, would spend uh, time just getting on the website but accessing it through the Go Commando show, that allows the Go Commando show to continue to bring great guests like Rob and any of the other um, banners that are on the Go Commando show, whether it's Naked Zebra, where you can get the super sexiest clothing and ladies' apparel, uh, or any of the sports supplements, or entirely pets. These are things that uh, many of our listeners utilize and need, and uh, purchasing through those organizations allows you to uh, continue with the Go Commando show. So thank you very much to our commandos and to having Rob come out here all the way to Kansas in January when it's freezing. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and he's a great guest. I, I really did enjoy the time when, you know, when we first met and since, and I'm very proud to see, you know, him, you know, continue to, uh, duplicate his family and grow and reproduce as well as, uh, have some great experiences like writing this book and providing training, which he does with, uh, Evergreen Mountain, his organization, which, uh, you can see here in the banner and, uh, please go to his website and consider that is uh, something that your organization can benefit from his leadership training as well as his tactical training. So thank you very much, Commandos, and we look forward to bringing you another great show soon, some of the upcoming shows we have, uh, some more military leaders from the Marine side, both officer and enlisted, talking about their combat experiences, and we even have a Marine Corps drill instructor coming to you soon. So Thank you again for listening and God bless. To all my fellow grunts out there who in your youth felt it was your duty to protect us, 
I salute you. And thanks to the listeners of the Go Commando Show who labor on the farm, who are sweating on the construction site, putting forth your very best at the office. You are making a difference. Support the Go Commando Show in our pursuit of bringing you the highest quality professionals. Infiltrate the website at gocommandoshow.com where you can view all of the podcasts and arm your team with incredible deals on health supplements, commando clothing, and equipment. Every time that you get a good deal, it supports the show. What deals? When you purchase anything from the website, Amazon, healthcare supplements, you're covering our six. And to the ladies on the team, when you outfit yourself in the super sexy threads from Naked Zebra, and yes, I'm talking about in a fuego. You are firing the sniper shot for our commandos. How else can you support? It's simple. You smash the follow and subscribe buttons on our social media. That is how you support us bringing great guests to talk about serious subjects, not the mainstream media's fake news. So thank you. And until our next show, stay in the attack and go commando. Thank you.